is for political debate today, that they are not only leaders, but also servants, and that it is our responsibility to serve the common good of all. Give them courage to make just decisions that increase well-being for all in Cobb County. Remind them that no matter where we live, everyone is our neighbor, our sibling, and that throughout the ages, prophets have called the leaders of the people to respect and protect the least of those among us, our children, the elderly, the poor, those who are hungry, those who have no homes, those who are ill in body, mind, or spirit, the strangers and immigrants in our midst, those who live on the margins, those who are alone, those who are forgotten. Grant that barriers which divide us may crumble, suspicions disappear, and hatreds cease. Heal our divisions, that we may live in justice and peace. Holy One, protect these commissioners, body, mind, heart, and soul, that they are free to do their work and enjoy their lives. Give them rest when they need it, joy, and peace. Grant them and us the wisdom and courage to know and do what is right and good and true. May they and we speak out when it is time to speak out and listen patiently and receptively when it is time to listen. May they and we always be guided by the spirit of community, by the spirit of justice, and by the spirit of love. This we pray in the name of all that we hold sacred and holy, all that we hold good and right, and true. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Reverend Abrams, thank you for that wonderful invocation. Our meeting is now officially called to order. I'm going to turn things over to John Peterson, who is our zoning manager. And thank you, Madam Chair and Board. Today's hearing will be conducted with the following process and procedure. Each case will be called in numerical order. When the case is called, we would ask that the applicant please stand up and raise a hand to show that they are in attendance. After that, we're going to call to see if anyone here is opposed to that specific case. We would also ask that the opposition please stand up and raise their hand so they can be counted for the record. Uh, after the counting of the opposition, uh, both parties will be asked to come forward to be sworn in so they can present testimony to the Board of Commissioners. Each side gets 10 minutes to state their case of concerns. Uh, it's a very important to note there's not a rebuttal process and there's not a process to reserve your time. So you want to convey all your information to the Board within your 10 minute time period. Additionally, if there's more than one person who wishes to speak on an issue, you may want to coordinate with each other about what you're going to talk about because each side only gets 10 minutes and you don't want to cover the same information twice. Then uh, after the 10 minute presentation, uh, the board will start to discuss the uh, case at hand. From the discussion, they may, ask, they may ask one or more speakers to come back to the front for additional comments or questions. And after that, the board will make a decision to either hold, continue, approve, or deny the case at hand. Madam Chair and Board, uh, there are four cases on today's printed agenda, excuse me, five cases on today's printed agenda, which have been withdrawn without prejudice, and these cases will not be heard today. First case is rezoning case Z34 of 2022, Rise Properties, LLC. This case has been withdrawn without prejudice and will not be heard today. Next case is rezoning case Z36 of 2022, David Granat. This case has been withdrawn without prejudice and will not be heard today. Next case is rezoning case Z51 of 2022, Lenar, Georgia, Inc. This case has been withdrawn without prejudice and will not be heard today. SLEP 10 of 2022, Top SC LLC. This case was withdrawn without prejudice and will not be heard today. And last case on the printed agenda is other business item number 38 of 2022, Draypack Investments LLC. This case has been withdrawn without prejudice and will not be heard today. Madam Chair and Board, we did get two requests late to withdraw cases without prejudice. So we would need a board vote on these two cases. First one is rezoning case Z42, Jonathan Conway, the Stonehands Group EBP, Inc. 
The applicant has asked that rezoning case Z42 be withdrawn without prejudice, Madam okay. Chair and Board. Okay, Commissioner Sheffield. Thank you, Madam Chair. I make a motion to withdraw Z42 from the consent agenda. Um, withdrawal without prejudice. Thank you. Second. Is there any further discussion? Call the question. <coughs> the vote passes 5 0. Thank you. Next case that, uh, in which the applicant is asking for a withdrawal without prejudice is other business item number 24, Hal Simpson. Uh, the applicant has asked this case be withdrawn without prejudice, Madam Chair and Board, so we, we would need a, a board vote to allow that to happen. Okay, Commissioner Sheffield. I make a motion to withdraw OB24 without prejudice. Second. Is there any discussion? Call the question. The vote passes 5 0. Thank you. There are a number of cases on today's agenda which have been continued or held by the Staff and Planning Commission, and these cases will not be heard today. First case is rezoning case Z7 of 2022, KM Homes. This case was uh, continued by the staff until the September 6th, 2022 Planning Commission zoning hearing. So Z7 of 2022 will not be heard today. Rezoning case Z35 of 2022, Morrison Building and Investment LLC. This case was held by the Planning Commission until the September 6th, 2022 Planning Commission zoning hearing. So Z35 of 2022 will not be heard today. Rezoning case Z41 of 2022, Southern Gas Partners LLC. This case was continued by the staff until the September 20th, 2022 Board of Commissioners zoning hearing. So Z41 will not be heard today. Rezoning case Z46 of 2022, Watmore LLC. This case was continued by the staff until the September 6th, 2022 Planning Commission zoning hearing. So Z46 of 2022 will not be heard today. Rezoning case Z47 of 2022, Angel Eye Studios 5 Incorporated. This case was continued by the staff until the October 4th, 2022 Planning Commission zoning hearing. So Z47 of 2022 will not be heard today. Rezoning case Z49 of 2022, Johnny Hastings, the Integrity, uh, Integrity Development Group. This case was continued by the staff to the September 6th, 2022 Planning Commission zoning hearing. So Z49 of 2022 will not be heard today. Rezoning case Z50 of 2022, Rom USA Properties, LLC. This case was held by the Planning Commission until the September 6th, 2022 Planning Commission zoning hearing. So Z50 of 2022 will not be heard today. Rezoning case Z52 of 2022, Newport 360 Capital, LLC. This case was held by the Planning Commission until the September 6th, 2022 Planning Commission zoning hearing. So Z52 of 2022 will not be heard today. SLEP 5 of 2022, Parallel Towers 3, LLC, also known as Parallel Infrastructure, LLC. This case was continued by the staff until the September 6th, 2022 Planning Commission zoning hearing. So SLEP 5 of 2022 will not be heard today. OSC 1 of 2022, Green Community Development, LLC. This case was continued by the staff until the September 20th, 2022 Planning Commission zoning hearing. So OSC 1 of 2022 will not be heard today. Madam Chair and Board, there are two cases on the other parts of the agenda in which uh, the case needs to be continued. So we would need a board vote on these two cases. First one, excuse me, three cases. First one is rezoning case Z38, David Pearson Communities Incorporated. Uh, this case needs a little bit more work, Madam Chair and Board. So the staff would ask that the board continue rezoning case Z38 uh, until your September 20th zoning hearing date. Okay. Commissioner Sheffield. I make a motion to continue Z38 to the September Board of Commissioners hearing. And I would also request of the applicant if he can be accompanied by, um, there you are, the applicant's representative if uh, the applicant can um, accompany you at the hearing. Okay, is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? Call the question. The vote passes 5-0. Thank you. Next case is rezoning case Z48, OM Enterprises 9, LLC. Uh, this is also a case, Madam Chair and Board, that may need a little bit more work on the concept. So the staff would ask the board to continue rezoning case Z48 until your September 20th uh, zoning hearing date. Okay. Commissioner Sheffield. I make a motion to continue Z48 to the September 20th Board of Commissioners zoning hearing. Second. 
Is there any discussion? I'll call the question. The motion passes 5-0. And last case that needs to be continued is other business item number 41 of 2022, Twilliga, uh, Twilliga Papa's Multifamily Partners, LLC. Madam Chair and Board, this does need some more work uh, to address some staff comments. So the staff would ask the board to continue other business item number 41 until your September 20th hearing date. Commissioner Burrell? Yes. Um, correction, 60 days. 60 days. Um, we're requesting a traffic study because of the time frame of this originally being zoned and um, when a lot of, of development it's right across from KSU Stadium, so we need a traffic study. Um, and the applicant has agreed to that, but uh, with DOT's comments, we need uh, 60 days for them to do the study and uh, DOT to review it. So I'm, I make a motion that we continue OB 41 until the October zoning hearing. All right, I'll second. Is there any further discussion? Call the question. The motion carries 5-0. Thank you. Thank you. And just to clarify that motion, the, the hearing is October 18th for the hearing. October 18th. Thank you. John, before we go to consent, can you clarify for me the additional cases that we added to the withdrawn cases? The, the two cases? Yes, please. Okay. First one, um, rezoning case Z42, Jonathan Conway. Mm -hmm. There are some um, things that some variances that the applicant was asking for that they could not meet. And okay. there were some DOT issues also that they could not meet. Sure. Okay, and there was another matter, I think was an other business item. Oh. Yeah, uh, other business item number 24, House Simpson. This was a lot size reduction, and the, the, the applicant okay. was not able to work out uh, an agreement with the neighbors to maybe acquire some more property to get up to a, higher, a bigger lot size. Okay, thank you. Appreciate that, John. Just wanted to make sure that I was following this correctly in, in my notes. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, before we start the consent, I would like to ask the folks in today's audience, if you have a cell phone, please turn your cell phone on mute. Uh, when the phones ring, any audience, it does fear, interfere with the broadcast and the presenta uh, presentations. And any person wishing to speak before the board commissioners must file a campaign contribution disclosure statement. If they made a, a campaign contribution to one of the current members of the board commissioners within the last two years, totaling $250 or more. Additional information about this requirement is located on the table in the back of the room. And I want to remind applicants, opposition, or any interested party that information is due to this board the Wednesday prior to this hearing. Any information submitted after the Wednesday due date may or may not be considered by the board at their discretion. And at this point, Madam Chair, I'm ready to start the consent agenda. Cobb County Board of Commissioners, zoning hearing consent agenda for August 16th, 2022. First case on consent is rezoning case Z45 of 2022, Joseph Dora. The applicant is asking a uh, rezoning from NS to NRC for a professional office in land lot 202 of the 17th district. The property is located on the east side of Sandtown Road, south of Windy Hill Road. The Planning Commission recommends approval of Z45 to the NRC zoning district, subject to the following conditions. Number one, site plan received by the Zoning Division dated May 24th, 2022. Number two, final site plan to be approved by the District Commissioner. Number three, professional office use only. Number four, applicant owner or developer to install uh, six required parking spaces prior to the, any use of the property. Number five, installation of a 20-foot landscape buffer along all residentially zoned properties with the County Arborist to approve the final landscape plan. Number six, fire department comments and recommendations. Number seven, stormwater management division comments and recommendations. And number eight, department of transportation comments and recommendations. Is the applicant present? Yes, sir. Let the record show the applicant is here. Is there anyone here opposed to rezoning case Z45? No. Let the record show there's no one opposed. Commissioner. Chair, I'd just like to amend um, special step number two to read that the final site plan and elevations to be approved by the district commissioner. So I'm inserting and elevations. Okay, is the applicant amenable to that change? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Applicant, for those um, watching this um, online or by TV, the application did um, confirm that he's in agreement. Thank, thank you. you. 
Next case is rezoning case Z53 of 2022. Learcy Development Partners LLC request rezoning from GC to R15 uh, for a single family residence in land lot 1297 of the 19th district. Property is located on the northwest side of Old Bankhead Highway at the terminus of Ricky Lane, south of Veterans Memorial Highway. The Planning Commission recommends approval of Z53 to R15, subject to the following conditions. Uh, site plan submitted at today's hearing, which was the PC hearing on uh, August 2nd, 2022. District Commissioner to approve the final uh, approval of the site plan. Number three, elevation shown at the PC hearing on 8-2-2022. Number four, garage located on the site plan shall be renovated to match uh, the architectural style of the primary residence on the site. And uh, number five, inclusion on the consent agenda. Is the applicant present? Let the record show the applicant is here. Is there anyone here opposed to rezoning case Z53? No. Let the record show there's no one opposed. And also, much like the previous case, I'd like to amend step number two to read district commissioner to have final approval of the site plan and elevation. So I'm including and elevations to the step. Okay, is the applicant amenable? Okay, the applicant is nodding yes. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you. it. Thank you. Okay, moving into land use permits on the consent agenda. LDP 12 of 2022, Maria Claudia Ortega requests a temporary land use permit for a daycare, which is a renewal of LEP 11 of 2020 in land lots 1949 and 1950 of the 16th district. The property is located on the east side of Allgood Road, north of Camellia, uh, Camellia Drive. The Planning Commission recommends approval of Lot 12 for 24 months, subject to the following conditions. Number one, maximum of 20 children. Number two, maximum of four employees. Number three, no signs. Number four, no parking in the right of way. And number five, Department of Transportation comments and recommendations. Is the applicant present? Let the record show the applicant is here. Is there anyone here opposed to LEP 12? That director says no one opposed. Thank you. And moving into other business items on the consent agenda. First case is other business item number 32 of 2022, which is to consider a stipulation and site plan amendment for Longo Homes, Inc., uh, also Vincent Longo, regarding rezoning application Z182 of 2005 for property located on the west side of Marshall Road, south of Hathaway Road in land lot 270 of the 20th district. Staff recommends approval subject to the following conditions. Number one, site plan received by the zoning division on May 25th, 2022. Number two, applicant to provide a 12 foot side setback on the southern property line, 10 foot of which shall, uh, will be an undisturbed buffer with any sparse areas to be replanted to buffer standards as required. Said plantings, if required, shall be approved by the county arborist, uh, Cobb County arborist. Number three, fire department comments and recommendations in the other business packet. Number four, stormwater management comments contained in the other business packet. Number five, Department of Transportation comments contained in the other business packet. And number six, all previous stipulations not in conflict with this amendment to remain in effect. Is the applicant present? Yes. Dr. Rex, so the applicant is here. Is there anyone here opposed to other business item number 32? No. Dr. Rex, so there's no one opposed. Other business item number 37 is to consider a, an amendment for Chris Robinson regarding rezoning application Z25 of 1994 for property located on the north side of Jamison Road, west of Canton Road in land lot 1661 of the 16th district. Staff recommends approval subject to the following conditions. Number one, window tinting company is permitted. Number two, no auto repair or car washing on site. Number three, fire department comments contained in the other business packet. Number four, stormwater management comments contained in the other business packet. And number five, all previous stipulations not in conflict with this amendment to remain in effect. Is the applicant present? Is there anyone here opposed to other business item number 37? No. Uh, Madam Chair and Board, uh, let the record show that the applicant is not present and there is also no one here opposed to other business item number 37. Okay. Commissioner Burrell, do you wish to proceed? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. And last item on consent is other business item number 40 of 2022, which is to consider a stipulation and site plan amendment for Bartlett Heating and Cooling, Inc., regarding rezoning application Z35 of 2021. Uh, the property is located on the southeast side of South Cobb Drive, southwest of Pearl Street, and land lot 285 of the 17th district. Staff recommends approval, subject to the following conditions. Number one, Exhibit A contained in the other business packet. Number two, Fire Department comments. 
Oh, excuse me. You're right. Uh, correct number one, three, exhibit B contained in any other business packet. Number two, fire department comments and recommendations contained in any other business packet. Number three, Cobb DOT comments contained in any other business packet. And number four, all previous conditions or all previous stipulations not in conflict with this amendment to remain in effect. The applicant's representative is present. Is there anyone here opposed to other business item number 40? No. Let the record show there's no one opposed. And Madam Chair and Board, that completes the consent agenda. Thank you, John. Commissioners, is there anything else to add to consent? All right, with that, I move that we approve the consent agenda as it has been revised. Second. Are there any questions or comments? Call the question. The motion passes 5-0. Thank you. For those of you who had an item on consent, you are welcome to leave at this time as your matter has already been heard and approved, or you can stay. This would be a good time to um, transition if you need to. All right, John. Okay, moving into the continued or held case agenda. Madam Chair and Board, the next zoning case also has uh, and a, 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 a companion special language permit case with it. In the past, the Board has been amenable to hearing these two cases together. We did have one member of the public reach out yesterday and would like to hear both cases separately. So at this point, uh, I guess I'm asking the board, do you want to hear these together or separately? I'll defer to Commissioner Richardson. One depends on the other. Uh, is, is it, was there a rationale for? A uh, member of the public did not explain to me why they would like to have both cases heard separately. The only thing I can consider is you know, there's a slip analysis that has you know, additional questions. <coughs> Well, and Commissioner Burrell. Yeah. Normally we um, hear them, but vote separately. Correct. So, yes, you it would make a separate motion for each one. Yeah. yeah. But okay. it also um, gives extra um, presentation time for both sides. Right. Okay. Okay. So we can modify it too to just add the additional time since it's two matters to be heard and, and say. That would occur if we had to do both. Yeah. Yeah. But then the question is, is, the, is the information going to be any different? No, but it would, it would accomplish the same thing. I agree. Sorry. Thank you. It would accomplish the same thing if we did. It, it doesn't have to be the full 20 minutes. It could, it could be 15 minutes for the for to hear both yeah. of them if you want to. Yeah. Let's do 15. So, is the board amenable to do 15 minutes? Consensus? Okay, thank you. Fantastic. Okay, so we're here both together. We're here both together and provide 15 minutes okay. for both sides. Thank you. Okay, um, rezoning case Z78 of 2021, St. Benedict's Episcopal School requests rezoning from O and I uh, and R20 to O and I for a school in land lot 695 of the 17th district. The property is located on the east and north side of Daniel Street, uh, on the wet and on the west side of Cooper Lake Road. Together with its companion special needs permit, SLEP 11 of 2021, St. Benedict's Episcopal School requests a special language permit for a school in land lot 695 of the 17th district. The property is located on the east and north side of Daniel Street and on the west side of Cooper Lake Road. The applicant is present. Can I get a show of people here who are opposed to rezoning case Z78 and SLEP 11? Please stand up and raise your hands. Okay, let the record show there are six people here in opposition to rezoning case Z78 and SLEP 11. Can I get a show of people here who are in support of rezoning case Z78 and SLEP 11? Please stand up and raise your hands.
Let the record show there are 57 people here in support of rezoning case Z78 and SLEP 11. Uh, all those who wish to address the board, please come forward to be sworn in. Go ahead, Kevin. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair and Board of Commissioners. I'm Kevin Moore here this morning uh, and pleased to represent uh, St. Benedict's Episcopal Day School uh, in this application. Uh, you have heard this now uh, multiple times, uh, so I want to be sure to simply state that I'm just going to incorporate the statements and presentations that we have made on prior hearings so that today I can simply bring forward to you uh, what has occurred since our last meeting. Uh, according to your direction uh, and what has come of that in terms of uh, changes uh, and updates to the overall plan, stipulations uh, as well. Uh, with that, uh, since the last meeting, we have held three community meetings. Uh, those were uh, notified, or notice was provided by both postcard and email uh, to community members. Uh, those meetings were held on July 27th, August 3rd, and August 5th. So not just a single community meeting, but three community meetings. And please be aware too that prior to that time, uh, for the last two years, there have been a number of meetings that, in which the community has been invited and in which there has been discussion and conversation uh, prior to that time as well. Uh, also, uh, to remind you again, you, this is the property you're looking at on your screen. Uh, the property's there uh, just off Atlanta Road uh, at the intersection of uh, Cooper Lake, Daniel Street and Weaver Street, and you see the property is currently zoned O and I primarily, uh, with a small portion of it zoned R20. Uh, the O and I zoning category is with certain limitations and stipulations, and that's why this is in for a zoning rezoning to rezone the entire property to O and I with new stipulations, as well as for a special land use permit, which is necessary uh, for uh, the expansion of the private school, which is St. Benedict's, which is, has a nice well-earned reputation uh, for being a community member, community partner uh, here uh, at this exact same location along Cooper Lake uh, and Atlanta Road. Uh, the primary issue that's been discussed any number of times uh, has been us working with DOT and coming to some sort of um, <coughs> recommendation uh, from Cobb DOT on how to handle the traffic, knowing that this particular intersection at Daniel Street and Atlanta Road has been uh, a issue and a problem uh, that's not of uh, recent uh, history. It has a long history of being a, a, an issue and one in which uh, DOT, as I understand it, uh, will, uh, as it moves forward in the future, uh, if approved, uh, will continue to look at this as a system improvement that can occur uh, at some point. And we'll get into that a little bit uh, as far as what St. Benedict's contribution will be to that. Because what came th from our last meeting, uh, DOT uh, had an opportunity to fully review the updated traffic study. This was, again, also in concert with multiple traffic studies uh, that had been provided and performed and, and given to DOT for their review. And upon their final review, DOT had a series of recommendations. Those recommendations we have now incorporated and included in our proposal, uh, both with a revised site plan and revised uh, stipulation letter dated August 10th, and we have agreed to each and every one of the DOT recommendations, and I'll highlight those for you on this plan. Awesome. All right, turn into the site plan itself. Uh, just to orient everybody, this is Cooper Lake Road on the right-hand side, Daniel Street out to Atlanta Road here, uh, and as well as Daniel Street uh, curves along our frontage of the property uh, here. Uh, DOT's recommendations were to provide for no access on Cooper Lake, 
And if you recall, here is where the stop sign is located uh, for this intersection of the, of, the, of the various streets as it approaches uh, Atlanta Road. Uh, so no access on Cooper Lake Road. Uh, access on this section of uh, Daniel Street is also uh, restricted. Uh, we have currently are showing a uh, one access point here uh, that is called out. You'll see it has an X. It's called out as an emergency access only if warranted by Cobb County Fire. Uh, they may, in fact, with this arrangement, not require there to be an additional emergency access location. If so, our stipulations call for that to be removed entirely. Uh, but if it's needed or required by the Cobb County Fire, it is restricted to emergency access only, and it will be blocked and gated in accordance with the fire standards. Uh, next, with, next, what has been recommended by DOT is for the access to occur here on Daniel Street. This is Weaver, where it comes into Daniel. Uh, this is Daniel Street here. If you continue on Daniel Street to the north, uh, it intersects again with Cooper Lake Road at that location. However, uh, due to the width of Daniel Street here, uh, north of this site, uh, what is being recommended by DOT and we're agreeing to is to restrict uh, where traffic enters and exits uh, here, uh, both in the morning and, and, and afternoon carpools. Uh, traffic uh, leaving the site uh, must turn left which we can control because we can control that access movement at our entrance, must turn left and go down Daniel Street out to either Weaver or um, Cooper Lake and Atlanta Road in this direction. Uh, also, incoming traffic uh, must come in uh, along Daniel Street and take a right. Uh, so it is a right in, left out, uh, restricted access point as recommended by uh, DOT. Uh, in furtherance of that, they have recommended that this segment of Daniel Street from our entrance along Daniel Street be improved uh, so it can provide for appropriate, safe um, width of pavement. So it must be entirely improved uh, with curb, gutter, uh, and width, additional width of pavement. Uh, that will come at an additional cost to St. Benedict's, somewhere around $300,000 uh, by putting the access here. Uh, to improve Daniel Street, uh, which St. Benedict's has agreed to do, and that's included within our stipulation letter as well. Um, in addition, uh, DOT has recommended uh, that a $200,000 contribution uh, be made to DOT for the uh, future study uh, of this area uh, as a system uh, study to determine uh, from DOT standpoint what could be possible and what would be uh, achievable uh, from an overall traffic solution standpoint, knowing that, and keep in mind, the school would not be built for at least three, this additional middle school would not be built for at least an additional three years from today. Uh, so there is a lot of lead time out there, uh, and that contribution will go a long way uh, towards preparing the county for that. And again, those are um, conditions and stipulations recommended by DOT, which we have incorporated into our plan and as well as included specifically in our stipulation letter. So it's very clear uh, what we're agreeing to and what has been recommended by DOT. Our stipulation letter also has been updated to include all of the Planning Commission recommendations and comments for approval that they gave. Please just keep in mind the Planning Commission reviewed and, and considered this matter and recommended approval of these applications, but had additional stipulations uh, that they wanted to see. Those are now included in total in our uh, stipulation letter. Uh, and I'll just highlight a couple of those just so you know what they are. Number one was the creation of a neighborhood, um, a neighborhood committee uh, for purposes of communication between the school and the neighborhood uh, consisting of the, the subdivisions that surround uh, this school. Uh, those communications have occurred over the last decade regardless. Uh, however, uh, this would formalize that process for them. In addition, there is a limitation uh, or a maximum number of students. If you recall, initially this was a maximum student population for just the middle school here. Uh, it would be 320. That has been reduced to 240 and is also further limited uh, in terms of the carpool capacity, which we meet here as well, the formula that's placed in there, but there is a limitation uh, of the maximum number of middle school students at this location, as well as you can see the site plan before you. Uh, one of the recommendations from the Planning Commission is that this be uh, the extent of development on this site as a phase. Any future phases 
uh, to the extent that they would be proposed must come back to the Board of Commissioners for approval. Uh, so what you're looking at is what is being proposed uh, for uh, the middle school uh, location of St. Benedict's here. In addition, our stipulation letter includes uh, conditions uh, that were uh, gathered uh, from our meetings with the area residents. To highlight those, uh, we have agreed to a landscape berm along Daniel Street to provide landscaping and actual berming along Daniel Street, and that's along that left-hand side of your site plan. We've agreed to conditions uh, to uh, limit lighting uh, as well as restrict uh, with signage as allowed, but certainly from our standpoint, restrict any school-related uh, parking. Uh, there'll be no parking along any of these public streets, uh, that, that being Cooper Lake, uh, Daniel Street and Weaver Street as well. Uh, also, uh, we have uh, agreed that the exterior finishes and elevation will be consistent, compatible uh, with the um, you know, architectural style and composition that you find in this exact neighborhood and in this particular area. To that end, Uh, we've even had our architect provide us a rendering, uh, a very recent rendering, uh, demonstrating how that would look and feel in terms of the overall development of the property, as well as uh, from an exterior finish standpoint, one that is much more, that is compatible and consistent uh, with the area in terms of its uh, look. As you can see, it doesn't have an institutional look. It has very much a neighborhood look uh, overall that's reached there. And that's shown for you and for uh, illustrative purposes. What we've presented at this point now uh, is a comprehensive package of conditions and stipulations that mirror all Cobb County staff recommendations and their staff recommendations were for approval. And we've incorporated their comments and recommendations and specifically have incorporated each and every DOT, Cobb DOT comment and recommendation for uh, this proposal and for this applications. In addition, uh, the your Cobb County Planning Commission reviewed, considered, and voted to recommend approval of these applications with additional uh, stipulations and conditions. Those stipulations and conditions have likewise been fully incorporated uh, into what is being presented to you today. With that, uh, we believe that what is being presented and what is being reviewed and carefully reviewed, this application had been through several hearings before the Planning Commission, several hearings before this Board of Commissioners, all with great purpose and intent, uh, that being to ensure that the issues that have been identified have been properly evaluated by the professionals and that recommendations, if any, were brought forth based on actual studies uh, for this proposed project. That has been done and has been fully incorporated uh, by St. Benedict's into this proposal. To remind you again, uh, St. Benedict's has been an excellent school for this area. St. Benedict's has been an excellent school for the neighborhoods that are adjacent to this area and that are within this area. It's been an excellent community partner. Their communication has long been open, has long been one uh, that Communication goes both ways, uh, and that has continued. This particular property being brought into the St. Benedict's campus seems like a very, very natural extension of where St. Benedict's is and allows for that school to continue to thrive and to continue uh, to be a wonderful partner uh, in this particular area. It is their neighborhood school, and we think it can continue to be that uh, with approval here. I'm here to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, we also have representatives directly from uh, St. Benedict's uh, that may can answer questions that I cannot, and we'd respectfully request your approval of this application uh, subject to our letter of agreeable stipulations. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else to speak in support? We have two more minutes left. Seeing none, we'll now go to opposition. And just please be mindful, there are a number of people who stood up in opposition who <clears throat> would probably like an opportunity to speak, so just be aware of your time. And Chairwoman, with that, the, the, the time counter is on the podium, so you can also watch that. So. Thank, Thank you. you. So we agree with Kevin Moore, that St. Benedict's has been a good member of the community. 
We disagree on the point that this parcel is a suitable location and continue to disagree for the reasons outlined in the email sent to the commissioners um, sorry, this past week. I know you've been here multiple times. May you state your name for the record, please? Yes, Christina Kreitzer, president <coughs> of the Kensington Green Homeowners Association. Thank you. So the parcel continues to remain below county ordinances. It is not straight O&I. It is O&I with numerous stipulations with the intent that it continues to be a residential area and having the own traffic engineer that they hired say that traffic is a mess and have the DOT look at this and say that even the solution that's put forward as a possible solution is still going to be a mess. The experts aren't in agreement that this is going to fix it for the long term nor fix it for the volume that this is going to include. 100% of the traffic now routes directly in front of the only entrance and exit that Kensington Green has and culminates at that one spot that neighborhood has no alternative to avoid the school and to the traffic that it bears. With that, we also do not have the look and feel of the community. That, that site plan that we just saw was not shared in any of the community meetings, nor has it been distributed since the community meeting. So this is the first time yet again that we see anything. While we do agree that it is continuing to improve and they are continuing to incorporate feedback, at the end of the day, it doesn't change the lot size and the volume and the traffic situation. We respectfully request that you continue to vote no on, these, on this particular zoning variance. We have zoning code within Cobb County for a reason. We pay for a, a master plan and residents buy based on that master plan and the commitment from the county that a residential neighborhood will remain residential. And this is not the case. Putting this further back, it is not the same location as the current St. Benedict's, which is facing Atlanta Road. This is further back within the community in arterial roads that don't support it. So we do continue to request that you deny. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Hal Colbert. I reside at 2005 Kensington Green Drive in the Kensington Green subdivision. Um, at the last meeting, I left here with a very clear understanding that we would have community input into what is being presented today for your approval or disapproval. We did have some community meetings. There was no community input. Um, I mentioned that after the last meeting with Amy Diaz, all the attention seems to be on Atlanta Road as far as traffic. They need to give some consideration to the Daniel Street, Weaver, and Cooper Lake portions of this development uh, with hopes of making it better. All we've done here is they have moved the mess that the traffic engineer for the school alluded to that would occur at Cooper Lake Road, you now move that mess over to Daniel Street. And from what I've been able to read with directing the traffic from Daniel down to Weaver to keep it off of Cooper Lake, we are totally landlocked then at Kensington Green. So um, at the meetings that I attended, and I attended one in person, there were three meetings, we were presented with this scenario. We were not given input. DOT, I emailed the EOT to see if they would be there. They said no, they didn't know of any meetings. So we in the community gave no input to what you're seeing today. So I request, and many others of us at Kensington Green request that you deny this application. This, this parcel was placed in the low medium density residential category in a master land use plan for a reason. It is a residential site. It is not a commercial and institutional site. So I ask you to please deny this application. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Mary Rose Barnes with Oakdale Community Association. After nine months of delays and holds, St. Benedict's has failed to come up with a project that encompasses the critical details and would be uh, acceptable to the community. The Reverend Sullivan has told us from the very beginning that this would uh, be a middle, new middle school. However, the August 10th stipulation letter does not include any designation of grades. Middle school grades were clearly designated in the uh, 
2013 middle school application. So we have to wonder why this critical information was omitted in this application. What are the actual plans of the property? Again, the nine months extension, in the nine months extension, there were no renderings of elevations presented. We were promised that we would have these before this meeting, what we saw this morning. First time we've seen it, a general, general, general look at it, not the whole idea. This is inexcusable. No applicant, ap applicant should expect an approval of a project at the location with this first having supplied detailed architectural information to this board and to the community. The Reverend Sol Sullivan supplied us with a conceptual <coughs> la layout of the project at a community meeting, but at the time we did not know that it was, the project was not, not to be site plan specific and the configuration and the location of the buildings and placement of features would not be included necessarily. Although we've been told that the school would not open for five years or more because of the final school's financial circumstances, the SIP letter does not include that, that detail. Neighbors have no idea how long the property might remain in its present derelict state or even if the school would actually be, be built in the school's, if school circumstances change or if the school decides to seek another another uh, location which is more amenable with a commu co 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 excuse me a, co a cohesive layout cohesive layout st benedict's has attempted to do this in the past although business hours are critical to the operation of a school and to the quality of life in the neighborhood the sip letter omits this information when would carpool begin and end would there be after school programs, evening, weekend and meetings and evening athletics activities? No applicant should expect approval of a school without supplying such a closure of hours to the neighborhood and to your board in advance of a hearing. The Reverend Sullivan stated uh, at community meetings that there would be no lights at the, at the play field, but the SIP letter clearly states that there would be lights for this field. This contradiction is, of course, leads to our presumption that there would be busy, busy and noisy interruptions to our neighbors' weekend nights and weeknights and weekends in this application, if this application were to be approved. It is evident that St. Benedict does not intend to demolish the derelict buildings on the property until construction should begin. Uh, there's no delineation of such wording in the, in the SIP letter. Timely demolition of, is customary and a huge expense, but, they're, they're, but one that, that a responsible developer should, should offer. Likewise, St. Benedict has not agreed to clear the property of the dead trees and shrubbery. Neighbors should not be exposed to, this, to these eyesores and safety as hazards for as long as five years or more. The SIP letter does not reference customary standards of underground utilities, garbage disposal facilities, monument signage, and, and uh, St. Benedict says it does have a pole sign, and, and promotion of outside bells, pagers, or, or phones, and construction parking on public roadways. We have to wonder why St. Benedict's would, it was failed to recognize the necessity of, of clearing, of dealing with these, with these dealing with our myriad problems and concerns. In short, it appears that St. Benedict's is asking the county to accept a proverbial, proverb, proverbial post-dated blank check while Oakdale remains in limbo for an un, unknowable number of years. Oakdale Community Association Board along with Kensington Green Subdivision, respectfully request that you deny this application and thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Are there additional speakers in opposition? We have a balance of six minutes left. Okay, seeing none, I'm gonna turn things over to our district commissioner. Thank you. 
All right. Let's start the interviews. <laughs> so, Amy, Andrew. <laughs> Good morning, Drew Ressler, DOT. Fantastic. Um, Amy Diaz, DOT. Awesome. Um, so when we left off with our last hearing, there were a multitude of questions around traffic and the traffic study, um, what was actually studied, and whether or not there could be a reasonable recommendation that comes out of DOT with regards to this, this plan. What has come of, where, where are we at this point with that traffic study and the analysis? Where does DOT stand on it? Absolutely. Um, so I, I think just to, to talk about where we are, uh, if I could go over where we've been, would that, would that be helpful? Uh, so we, we have met multiple times with the traffic engineer for the applicant as well as the applicant and the, and the neighborhood to look at traffic in the area. Uh, traffic in the area is, is very challenged. And, and the primary, uh, if we could put up the overall uh, perfect. Uh, the, the primary challenge are the two intersections. First, the intersection at Atlanta Road and Cooper Lake, uh, and then the secondary intersection of Cooper Lake and Daniel. The, those intersections are very, very close together. That second intersection, Cooper Lake and Daniel, is an all-way stop. There, there's about three car lengths in between those, those two roadways. We have significant traffic uh, on the internal roads to the to the west side of that picture, coming on Daniel as well as northbound and southbound on Cooper Lake, all converging on that one intersection, uh, with the vast majority wanting to come out to to Atlanta Road. Uh, we, we've looked at a number of different options in, in coordination with the applicant as well as as just internally within the department. One option looked at was to take a, a new intersection. Uh, I don't know if it is it possible to, to point. That's okay. Um, so to look at a, a, a new intersection to the north, uh, where we would uh, cut off that access there between the the parking lot and the park, and then add a, a new intersection to the roadway uh, to the north. In doing that, we we move the traffic away from a lot of the residential areas, but it gets much closer to Cooper Lake, which is challenging from a traffic perspective to move that traffic up to, to Cooper Lake and adjacent to Cooper Lake, as well as a tight turn to get to Atlanta Road. We then looked at an option to the south. So on the southern end of the park, next to the existing school, could we take Cooper Lake over there and, and cut it across the top end of the parking lot of the existing St. Benedict School? Uh, but again, we have a lot of the same problems of, of a tight throat between Atlanta Road and the intersecting traffic to the west, it, as well as we're getting now closer to the southern intersection of, of Cumberland Parkway and, and all that is, is happening there. We also looked at uh, potentially a, a roundabout if we come up to the main intersections where uh, all of the traffic on Cooper Lake at Daniel uh, would be forced right in, right out. Uh, and then we would look at potentially the Kensington Green, uh, the, the, the entrance there is a roundabout, but that really got into the neighborhood and, and really uh, impacted some of those immediate properties as well as the, the geometry to the north on Daniel going out towards Cooper Lake Drive uh, created a, a very big challenge in terms of a roundabout in that location again uh, the, the access challenges coming out of Kensington Green being the challenge there. So looking through all, all these various options, there, there was really not a one that stood out as, as being able to, to address not just the specific project related traffic challenge or additional traffic volumes, but also the systematic traffic through, throughout the, the area. And, and that's where we landed on a, a final, final recommendation. The, the goal being all of the traffic for the, the proposed use being moved as far away from Atlanta Road as possible. Uh, so all of that traffic is then directed from Atlanta Road so that it does not come down from Cooper Lake Drive, uh, where, where Daniel Street is very, very narrow, but it comes rather from Atlanta Road up 
uh, and, and in doing that, we move it as far away from those two, two intersections that are creating the primary challenge and, and then also extend the queuing lengths for schools. What we found both with private schools as well as uh, the Cobb County School District that we've spent a lot of time looking at school traffic very specifically, it's a very intense peak for, for drop off and then the traffic goes away, a very intense peak for pickup and then the traffic generally goes away. The primary goal to managing school traffic is to get the queue off of the roadway network, get it on site for the school and let the school do its thing and getting the kids out of the car safely. And, and then again, getting, getting that traffic back moving on the, on the roadway network. But by moving it up Daniel Street, we maximize the length of that queue and, and pull off as much of that traffic as possible from, from the roadway network. And the, the one-way options of coming north to turn right in and then forcing traffic to come out and turn left to go down, again, maximizes the, the ability for the campus to take as much of that traffic and queuing as possible so that it does not queue on to the roadway network where there's already traffic challenges and expand and increase those, those challenges. Uh, in addition to that access, we also needed Daniel Street improved. It's a very narrow section, 18 to 20 feet wide. Uh, a typical roadway is closer to 22 to 24 feet wide. Uh, so by improving the roadway along the frontage of Daniel Street, that, that allows for a more standard width to be able to handle the increased traffic for the school. And then finally, we do recognize that there continue to be traffic challenges in this area. And, and, and we need to be very sensitive to the, the residents in the area for a final solution. A everywhere you turn in this area is someone's uh, front yard, someone's backyard, someone's driveway of their, of their residence. It's a very, very tight area, very challenging to find one that is both a technically viable solution and, and a solution that it would work with the community. And, and so the recommendation for the traffic study is to be able to go through a process of looking at what's technically feasible as well as what would be uh, agreeable to the community for a long-term traffic solution. Thank you. What, because um, I know there were other conversations in previous meetings about traffic management and the kind of commitment that can be made there. What is the enforceability of the right and left in that particular scenario? Absolutely. What, um, from, from my recollection, I believe what you're referring to is originally when the driveway was on the, the eastern end of the property closest to Atlanta Road, the, the additional traffic that would be coming southbound towards the, the intersection of Cooper Lake and Daniel would be, would be significant. And uh, so the, the compromise or, or the suggested solution from the applicant's engineer would be to have a PD there or someone from the school to force all of the school traffic to go straight through, to for, force them southbound, not out to Atlanta Road, uh, which would then take them uh, around towards South Cobb Drive. And, and while that works from, from a modeling standpoint, it does not work in practicality. The, the school would not be able to guarantee uh, police resources at the school every day uh, because police need to be able to, to allocate their resources based on, based on need. So they may not have the availability there. And then school personnel would not be able to, to enforce it. And, and then the additional challenge of there, there's also a daycare and townhomes to the north and being able to determine which traffic is there for the school versus, versus which traffic is there for the daycare or, or the townhomes would, would be very challenging. In uh, requiring the, the right in only and the left out only, it's, it's a very clear enforceable movement maneuver where if, if there is a challenge and enforcement is requested, be very clear that any vehicle that comes in has to turn right. And there's not a determination of, well, are they part of the school? Are they part of the neighbor? Any, any vehicle would have to turn right. And similarly, coming out, any vehicle would be required to turn left. And so it, it is something that is a, a more standard traffic control and more enforceable. But personnel would have to also be available to do that. A a absolutely. Mm -hmm. Any enforcement would, would require resources. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, we can open it up. I think, I, um, Drew, I just want to tag on to this conversation with the restricted right. So 
essentially if someone's coming down Daniel Street, they will not be able to do a left. So what is the potential that they're going to come down and essentially use, oops, nope, put that. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I thought that would be helpful. <laughs> yes, please. Okay. Thank you. What is the potential that drivers are going to come down and use the Kensington Green entrance to almost use that as a roundabout to change direction to go back to then make a right in? It's possible. It's possible. And, and that's a challenge currently, um, and, and Amy can, can provide more of the details, but, but currently the, the school does require that, that all of their traffic does not use uh, Weaver Street. And, and, and there's been some uh, conversation about how the school enforces that, but, but you're absolutely right. That, that is a challenge that would have to be considered of, of how to avoid traffic finding another way. Commissioners have any other questions? I ask Sheffield first. Go ahead, Commissioner, and then we'll go to Burrow. Um, in reviewing the site plan, if you can go back to that, I just have a question regarding the stacked vehicles. And it may not be very clear from there, but um, there appears to be, when you come in, there are two rows of traffic. And it appears that one lane is merged into the lane that's closest to the drop-off. You that's know, right. you're familiar? Right. So my, my question is, with it having to merge, there's going to be additional time that people are sitting um, in the vehicle. So I'm just wondering if that would also result in um, um, additional time in the queue. It, it, it may, but the offset for being able to queue on site is the, is the value in, in the recommendation of, of double stacking. Uh, re referring to the schools that, that we work uh, regularly with, with this, this, the Cobb County School District, uh, most of the time, when, when we go out and take a look and traffic is backing onto the roadway network, we ra rather than large improvements where they have to create a lot of additional driveways that there's just simply not space for, we look for opportunities to double stack the vehicles so that we can get more vehicles onto the footprint again to get, to get them off of the roadway. Uh, it, it is something that, and we'd be willing to work with the school. We've worked with the, the school district in the past on how to exactly, how to operate that, that weave. Uh, where, where cars do have to come, uh, once they come down that long driveway to get towards the parking lot, it's single stack, and then in the parking lot, it, it opens up into double stacking. Mm -hmm. And then as they make the turn, they stay double stacking until that, that red dot, which mm -hmm. is the, the drop-off point, at which point they would merge. That, that would require school staff to make sure it operates effectively so that they're, they're making sure vehicles are taking turns and then assistance to be able to, to unload unload the students. There's a learning curve that we've found with that, but, but once, once it takes effect, it, it is more effective to, to do that rather than to have the traffic back out onto the local roadway network. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Brown. Um, can you go over again the access at, the, at Kensington oh. Drive and north on Daniel? North on data, so any vehicle coming from, say, Atlanta Road um, would, would have to come through the intersection at Daniel, uh, across, across the front edge, and then turn, turn right uh, around that, that center island where the Kensington Green uh, entrance is, turn right to come north up Daniel, and then turn right into the school, make the way through the queue, come back to that same driveway, where they would be then asked to turn left to go out uh, back to the south, uh, it, it, and, and then a, again towards, uh, towards Atlanta Road. Okay, so since this has been changed um, or revised, is, de is DOT recommending approval of this plan, traffic plan? D DOT, yes. DOT looked at um, all of the various options that we talked about before, and um, we, if this site were to, to be approved, that, that is the, the, the best option in terms of, of traffic. Okay. Um, and I, have, I don't have any more for them. Any more questions? But I do have I do. 
That was an interesting response to mm -hmm. Commissioner Burrell's question. <laughs> you said the best option. What um, challenges would we still anticipate should this traffic plan be approved? Absolutely. It, 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 I, I understand uh, on the, the response. We, we do try the best we can to separate project improvements versus system improvements. Okay. A system improvement is absolutely necessary out there, regardless if, if this goes in all the more because we have additional traffic there. Even, even if uh, th this application were not to be approved, there, there are existing traffic challenges okay. out there. Um, so that's the, the hesitation that you hear there, okay. that uh, we, we, we need some transportation improvements to improve the, the safety and efficiency and effectiveness of, of the roadway network in that area. Okay. All of the options that we've looked at so far are don't, don't get at the full, the core uh, of, that, of that problem, and, okay. and so that final solution still eludes us. Okay, thank you. Um, Drew, this is just uh, going to the comment that there would be no parking on Daniel Street. The only way that's enforceable is if we have no parking signs put up, correct? That's correct. So, um, and again, because of the backlog and the parking queue is only for 69 vehicle on, vehicles on campus, but they're going to have 240, so that's only taking care of not even a third of the vehicles that they're expecting assuming that each family only brings one student. Um, what is the viability of putting no parking, stopping, or standing signs on Daniel in order to make sure that traffic doesn't get backed up in that area? Uh, I, absolutely, and, and I would need to consult uh, on, on whether that would be strictly done through the application or if that would be a separate agenda item to the board, but it would be something that, that would be a, a reasonable improvement or a reasonable accommodation given that uh, parking traffic on Daniel would, would block uh, visibility. It, it doesn't quite come up on this graphic, but there's some pretty steep vertical grades throughout that, that area. Uh, so, so having park traffic there with the additional traffic of the school would be, would be challenging. Um, so it's a, it's a reasonable recommendation from what we've reviewed. Okay. Um, another thing that came up was we're basically shifting the issue to Daniel Street. I can totally, I can certainly see that. Um, from this recommendation, what, how could you summarize the impact of Daniel Street? Uh, D Daniel Street currently, as I mentioned before, is a, is a very narrow road. Um, limited traffic that, that goes, goes th is able to, to go through there. Um, the ad advantages and disadvantages with, with the, what is being proposed before you the, this morning, the advantage is that Daniel Street, at least along the frontage of the school, is going to be widened uh, to a more standard width so that vehicles can pass right now. Vehicles uh, going opposite directions have a very difficult time navigating around each other, particularly if they're larger vehicles. Uh, so that, that would be improved. Um, the disadvantage is the, the school traffic is, is being moved there, uh, and, and that traffic does not exist, so that's additional trips coming onto and, and off of Daniel Street. Okay. But we do believe, are, are we, when we say we're recommending this as the... development recommend right as opposed to the system improvement the actual parts I forgot what phrasing you used project improvement. project and project improvement um, we're saying this parcel can accommodate the needs of the school as being requested I'm sorry that question again are we saying that this parcel can accommodate the needs of this school yes. as requested okay <coughs> those are my questions for you any other Questions for DOT? In the um, carpool plan, was that submitted to DOT? Yeah. Is there just one start time for the middle school or all the grades starting at the same time? Um, currently, I believe that they have a single start time, but one of the things in our comments is if that ends up with queuing on Daniel Street, that we can then come in with a mitigation plan that would include the potential of staggered start times. Okay. Commissioner Burrell. This might be 
for the applicant, but does the carpool plan include buses or just private cars, vehicles? To my knowledge, and the applicant can confirm, they do not plan any buses. It would be all private vehicles. Okay. Commissioner Gamble, do you have a question? If, if I can just tag on to that, because I know their other campus is just to the south of this location. Has there been consideration to have students dropped off at that campus and then St. Benedict's bus them to this campus to help cut down on traffic? And would that help mitigate some of the issues that DOT is trying to solve? Um, I don't believe that that has been explored. So that's certainly something that could be looked at. But um, the issue is, 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 of course, Daniel Street, as we mentioned, is already very narrow. They are going to improve it on their side. But the other side of Daniel Street is not part of their jurisdiction. And so the idea of having a lot of bus traffic on that section of Daniel Road would be something we would have to look at and make sure it was safe. Thank you. Any other questions for DOT? can always call them back up if we need them. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I would like to have it, uh, someone from opposition who attended all the meetings, all the community meetings. Is there anyone? Christine, did you attend all of the meetings, all the I community meetings? My schedule doesn't permit that. Got it. Okay. Maybe we can make up for all the meetings. <laughs> okay, great. Great. Oh. Um, so I understand that there have been some modifications after the meetings that were incorporated until it was presented today. What is the, what's the last bit of information that you have up until this point? Like, did you hear about the DOT recommendation with Daniel Street? Yes, we okay. did. Okay. And we shared our feedback that that still doesn't work for the neighborhood at that time. Right. The DOT was not present at any of the three meetings. Mm -hmm. May I address that for just a second? I've been involved in hundreds of millions of dollars worth of commercial development in my career. My problem with this is not the school going there. I haven't seen a traffic plan where the traffic actually flows. You're coming in and doubling back. You're one way in and one way out. Um, for this to work, in my opinion, you should enter perhaps on Cooper Lake and exit on Daniel. Um, you to give the traffic a, an opportunity to flow, and it could either flow to the right and go down to Cooper Lake Drive, or it could double back around. They don't have any options here. You, they're, just, they're in as bad a shape as we are during their pickup and drop off times. So I just don't understand this at all. It's very confusing to me. Okay. Um, thank you. Was there, what, what else? Um did you see today that you hadn't seen at your community meetings? The site plan mm -hmm. was not shared at the community meetings. The discussion, and the site plan today is, is a rendering. It's mm -hmm. not a site plan. It doesn't have the detail of the heights of the buildings, the facade of the buildings. I mean, it, it's a beautiful picture, um, but it doesn't give you the specificity to see what that's really gonna look like in the community. Um, we just we did mention that with them as a concern that we're being asked to approve a plan that's three to five years out and actively on st benedict's public website now you guys can pull it up you can see that they're already planning for phase three for the gym and the library still so this is this is one step of a three-phase plan okay. so those concerns are still out there on the table we also didn't hear the total capacity number of students at all campus locations so the presumed intent to backfill the students that are moving out of the school today into the new location and then backfill at the lower levels is still one that we have a concern about so the totality of the traffic because all all the campus locations are using that traffic still doesn't depict what that's going to look like for the impact of our community okay was there anything else that was included in the community meeting, I mean, that was not included in the community meeting that <coughs> you saw presented here today? No. Okay, thank you. I would also like to add that uh, the lack of uh, operating <coughs> hours being, not being uh, given in the application makes it extremely difficult even to figure on the traffic. Okay. Um, commissioners, did you have any? Um, 
This is for the residents of Kensington Green. Um, Cornelius, can you go back to the other? Yeah. Okay, when you exit the community and just confirm that Daniel Street is the only entrance of the community, there isn't one on the backside that we can't see. Is no, that there, the there is no additional exit, similar for, to the okay. strife of the school. Okay, so. Our community uh, was a zoning no, variance. No, that's, that's just, just simply yes or no. It's just simply yes or no. Thank you, I no. appreciate that. So when you exit the community, um, do you guys typically turn left or are you turning right on Daniel Street? It depends where the residents are going, so I can't speak with that. Okay, during commuter traffic or during <clears throat> the time of traffic for the school, are most residents turning left or right? I'm I just can't trying to get it. Okay, on that. sir, can you, do you live in the community? Yes. Yeah. Um, during the hours of operation for the school, do you find that most residents exit the community and turn left or turn right? And the reason I'm asking that question is because if if the vehicles are going to be stacked on Daniel Street to enter the school or to exit, I, I just, I'm trying to get an idea of any additional backlog or inconvenience for those that are coming out of the community and turning left. Well, I can't speak for the rest of the residents, but for me, it kind of depends on the time of day where the traffic is normally. If I want to get out on Atlanta Road or if I want to head back toward um, Cobb Drive, I will go out to the left. So it just sort of depends on where I'm headed and what the traffic volume is that day. Part of my concern is when they're exiting, there will be a steady stream of traffic coming out and perhaps without a stop sign before our entrance, we may not have a break in that traffic and have to sit there and just, you know, okay. wait. Okay, thank you. So, thank you. I was gonna say DOT might be able to better if we're looking at general statistics. Okay. Actually, and Amy, I see you coming minute. up. There's multiple. No, I was gonna have. Uh, no, let's have DO, let's have um, Commissioner Richardson requested DOT to help respond to Commissioner Sheffield. Can you please help do that, and then we can go to others. Yes, ma'am. What specifically would you like us to address? My question was when, when the residents exit Kensington Green subdivision during the hours of operation for the school, do you find that or was there any studies done with respect to if the majority of the residents are turning left out of the community or turning right? So I have some site observations, but that intersection wasn't actually studied since it's not serving the school. It's really kind of their private entrance. Mm -hmm. But from observation, most people do turn toward Atlanta Road okay. because that's the, the major roadway that's closest. Okay, thank you, Amy. Mm -hmm. And just to answer Commissioner Richardson from earlier, the, the most recent traffic study did accommodate all the students that are going to be at the new facility. They didn't they no longer backfilled, so they included more students in the most recent traffic study. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. Commissioner Burl or Gamble, did you have another question? Okay, Commissioner. Thank you. Kevin. certainly a lot um, to look at here. So with regards to the timing on the site plan and the renderings, mm -hmm. can you address sure. that gap in communication, please? Sure, I think let's make sure we're talking about the same thing. The site plan has been fully circulated amongst the community. The site plan that was shown today, as well as the DOT recommendations were fully circulated uh, to the community during the meetings. Now, one of the comments as was made uh, was uh, there was a comment about, well, we want to make sure that if um, this is, if, if it's built, that the exterior elevations, you know, kind of the, the look of the building is something that's consistent and compatible. So we included that stipulation that the exterior will be consistent and compatible with this area uh, as one of our stipulations. 
from that, St. Benedict's went ahead and got their architect just to do a rendering of what that would look like. That's why I, when I presented it, I simply was including it to show you, to show them how that could be accomplished, what that would be illustrated. That's not a, as it's clearly simply a architect rendering of taking to say, this could be something that it could look like because the renderings that had been shown for the last two years don't look anything like that. They were much more, had much more glass in terms of uh, their appearance uh, and not nearly as residential in their appearance or neighborhood in their appearance. So that's the only thing that has not been shared because it was just uh, pr it was just finished after this last meeting. It was something that they said, you know, let's go ahead and see what that would look like. So in the, I could have just not shown it, but we had it, and I thought it was an excellent gesture by St. Benedict's to provide that and to say, look, this is what's an example of what it could look like. As a, again, we're three to five years or more from building the school, so that, that could change, and we simply have stipulated the standard under which that would be. So, and that was just an illustrative example of what that could be. It's not included in our stip letter, for example. So it's simply presented to illustrate. Okay. And there are several other comments that came up as well. Sure. Um, specification on which grades, the designation of grades. It, it doesn't, but it's the middle school. If we need to stipulate grades, we're happy to do so. Mm -hmm. I believe it's five. Isn't it five through eight? Yeah, it's fifth through eighth grades, and we're happy to stipulate that. Okay. And then there was also a question around operating hours. It's it's a school, and it's a private school, and they can consistently operate at the hours they do now. But it's difficult when you're talking about a school. Yes, the school has its hours. Mm -hmm. And then there will be, at various times, there's after school, I mean, after school activities. It's not something that we see stipulated. Now, we we have some general... Op, those general operating hours or when the school is being used and, and so forth, we can stipulate that it will be used in that manner and, and consistent with that manner. Uh, but they uh, have operated very well for over a decade at this same location. They're also, because that was the next question, was around the after school programming, right? Yes, it is a school, but there are also other activities that you're expecting to have. Um, what about the lighting on the field? It sure. seems like there's a discrepancy there. There's not. Uh, again, we have stipulated because of that issue that came up that we would not provide any, quote, stadium lighting or it won't be a lighted field. What we have said is except for any lights just like that would be in a parking lot that is needed for security purposes. Um, you can't just have, if you see our site plan, we don't want to, <laughs> you can't have half your site being completely dark. Uh, there's got to be at least some element of security lighting, which would be along the parking lot and so forth. We're just trying to be careful. We're not, we don't want to light the field. We can say no lighting on the field. That's what we were saying. Um, we're just simply making sure, because as you can see the arrangement, uh, there will need to be, there's parking lot lighting that, is, that, is, that would be there. That's need, needed and necessary. It's, it's, you need it for security. It's required. That's all. Not that the field is being lit. And if we need to clarify that, I'm here to clarify that and say no lighting on this. This is not a lit field. It's not for that purpose. This is a middle school. They don't, even, they don't have uh, those other types of programs uh, here at St. Benedict's. And then there were also questions around prior to the build, um, the land maintenance, that three to five years sure. duration. What are we, is that something that can be stipulated as well? Absolutely. Again, they're a very responsible neighbor. And then the phase three discussion, the different phases. This is, this is the phase, and as again, that we have stipulated to uh, as part of our conditions that was recommended by the Planning Commission, that this is the phase. Any potential future phases that may or may not occur would have to come back in full, but this, there's, for this property, this is, this is it. What was the feedback um, with regards to the different options with, for traffic when you spoke with the community about this? Because well, DOT wasn't present at the meeting. That's concerning. Sure. And this had been communicated to DOT previously. Um, and you might have heard it as well, or by you, I mean the board may have heard this as well. You know, the, um, there had, uh, since day one, uh, there had been some in the community that, that were not in favor of having access on Daniel Street, uh, which is why all of our previous proposals had the access on Cooper Lake. 
Uh, that has always been communicated to DOT. Um, but as far as the community feedback, yes, I mean, with the restrictions that we're putting on there, I mean, some in the community, like you heard today, are quote opposed to it. Uh, other members in the very same community also with the restrictions in place and with, with the improvements that we're proposing are, are, are okay with it as well. They come down on both sides. The community is not just the five people who showed up today. The community is much larger than that and there are some in the community that share their opinion and there are many others in Kensington Green and the surrounding subdivisions that do not share that opinion. And that community feedback we received as well. Other questions for Kevin? Yeah, I do. Mm -hmm. um, from your stip letter from last year, October of last year, there was exhibit A and B with renderings mm -hmm. and the height and everything. Have those been revised or is that still the same? Those are no longer applicable. That, that was a different project. I mean, that was for this property, uh, but that project now has, uh, we had, um, additional built been an additional building at that point in time uh, we were proposing 300 a maximum of 320 mm -hmm. students at that time okay. uh, so it has been reduced since that time and, and that, as well as the input from the community on the way those appear versus what a more neighborhood school the neighborhood looking school that is having more uh, less institutional architectural elements would look that's the whole point of that stipulation so do you have the impervious and the height of the new renderings that were just submitted? In the height on there? Yeah. Is it on which one? Yeah, this site plan it's does have a proposed feet. height of 58 feet. It. Can you show it on here? Yes. It's in the legend. Excuse me, let me say, commissioners, all this talking amongst each other is frust it can be frustrating. Thank you. If the commissioner is asking a question of the speaker, let the speaker answer, unless the commissioner has indicated that she's seeking an answer from you individually. Thank you. You're welcome. To respond to the question, on our, this is our site plan that is part of our stipulation letter that was submitted. Uh, it has proposed maximum height of 58 feet. Um, yes, we'd be happy to stipulate a maximum of 70%. This impervious, and Carl's better percentages than I am, but I'm looking at this from an impervious standpoint as less than 60, maybe even 50. Uh, but yes, certainly less than, we can stipulate to no, a, a maximum of 70%. have any more questions for you I don't have any more questions okay, thank you, for you. Thank, thank you for your questions one more question for the community um, I think we can can you approach the bench one more time It was commented earlier that 
at the community meetings, there was sharing of information, but that there was no community input. What does that mean? It wasn't a Q&A session. It was a presentation. Okay, so. For the one that I attended. I didn't attend all three. Okay, okay. So no, no comments were provided back to the? There was discussion the amongst the participants, yes, but it wasn't a, hey, are you in favor of this DOT plan? What would you change? It was, this is the plan. And it was like, okay, here we are again. And I mean, back to as Kevin has previously stated, at the end of the day, the traffic plan, from the beginning, we have said Daniel Street is insufficient. We are still back to that point. Even with the enhancements, you can't exit that way. So that hasn't changed. We're still at the point that the lot size doesn't meet county code for a school, for the minimum. And the streets are not designed to support this traffic. In our neighborhood, as Hal Colbert mentioned, we will be landlocked. We won't have the ability to exit during key hours. That Those aren't, aren't gonna change with community meetings and community discussion. Mm -hmm. no, thank you. That was my only question. And then uh, Drew, Amy, one more question for you all. I know when we looked at this prior, there was the option of looking at entering on Cooper Lake and then exiting on Daniel Street. But it was Daniel Street before you get to Kensington in that render, in that mock-up. Had there been a review of looking at entering on Cooper and exiting on Daniel to the north? Do you want to take yeah. so that question also yeah. came up. So before this was even a zoning case, the school approached us with various carpool plans to get DOT input, and that was one of the options looked at. The issue is, is um, and I, I understand the idea of traffic flow, but when you have a queue going into a school, the double stacking and the more ability to have people on site is much more important than the idea of being able to flow through the site without stopping, because that's not really how schools operate. Mm -hmm. So this was the preferred plan of the various carpool plans that they gave us back before it was a zoning case, and, and we've returned to it as the final recommendation. Okay, thank you. I don't have any other questions. Does anyone else have any questions? Okay. I'm truly at a quandary on this one. So our code does serve a purpose. parcel sizes. The impact to the community is, I perceive, even from this drawing, can be very heavy. It landlocks. This is also my first time seeing this exact <laughs> version. I, I I don't think I can make a decision at this point in time. I don't, I, I'm receiving, um, hold on. I'm receiving, I don't know, 
just interesting information elements, and I'm not necessarily content with the options being presented. Um, I don't. I don't really know what my options are here, but <laughs> yeah. Are you um, willing to hear from additional commissioners? Uh, sure. I sure am. Commissioner Shaw. Um, I, I have a question with respect to the lot size. It was mentioned that mm -hmm. the lot size does not meet the county standard Correct. for the development. How off is the development in comparison to the county's um, standards? Because, you know, if, if we're relating that to the number of vehicles or even the number of students, then perhaps there can be consideration given to reducing yet again the number of students to try and, and better meet the, um, the, um, the traffic concerns. John, I'm not sure if you can okay. add okay. on to that one. Thank you. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah, the requirement is five acres for private school, and they have 4.2 for this application. Mm -hmm. Commissioner so Richard, yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead, Commissioner, I didn't know you were continuing. Off, eight, eight tenths, okay. Commissioner, we've um, gone back and forth with this many times, and I was going to wait for your motion to make some comments after it was seconded. And I will share with you the conclusion that I've had to come to in dealing with this for the amount of time that we've dealt with this mm -hmm. thus far. I think the concerns, the interest of all sides shared have weight in our value from the school in looking to expand to support a growing institution in the community to the residents that live across from the school who have had to deal with the brunt of the impact primarily we're hearing of traffic and then also from DOT looking at it from a technical perspective on traffic flow and impact to the public roads and I realize that the situation is imperfect and life often is imperfect we don't always get everything provided to meet every standard but yet there are still valid considerations that you know, we should take into account. And so I've just had to boil down this zoning application as um, uncomfortable as my analysis may be to some, this is what I've had to boil it down to. And I'm gonna do my best to explain I think we're weighing if the public good of education and if the public good of the service being provided to the community, if it outweighs the detriment to the immediate community, which primarily revolves around traffic. I believe that if you were to look at it from a sheer technical perspective, there is certainly a detriment that should be acknowledged. The detriment is that you have a school that is growing, but it is in a community that, or in a parcel that is designated as medium density residential. What is being asked does not fit within the future land use map. There have been a lot of discussions here on the board of whether or not there should be reliance on the future land use map, you know, a lot of time gets put into our comprehensive plan. People perhaps consider that when they're making housing purchase decisions. We know from listening to DOT beyond just the community development impact, there is a definite road impact. They have provided that the system, and we learned this from prior meetings, there are challenges with the roadway as it is today so of course, adding additional use, 
that is not consistent, even if you added public use consistent with the future land use map, adding anything to this community is going to tax this system more than what it is taxed today. And I get that, and, and that's why I prompted the meetings, can the community see how they can mitigate these concerns and try to have a, a, some type of meeting of the minds. What I did appreciate coming into today's meeting and listening is the fact that the school has provided some options over time to mitigate the detriment. It doesn't completely absolve it. Again, recognizing that nothing is going to completely absolve the traffic issues until that road is completely redesigned. But the carpool plan does help lessen the traffic on the school grounds. And they did provide that they do want to have a continuing, with the relationship, a continuing relationship with the community. They did provide that they will reduce the number of students. They did provide that the development that they'll provide, they will try to make it as consistent with the neighborhood as possible. So for my question, I, I do believe, for me, I can't speak for any other commissioner on this board, but I feel like the public good of the service provided, for me, outweighs the negative detriment where that negative detriment has been mitigated. And I believe that the school has tried and on multiple fronts is trying to mitigate that negative impact. My only concern, even in arriving to that conclusion, is if the school does move forward in this manner, will it remove the possibility of a system improvement? to the road system, and I'm, okay, and I'm seeing DOT say no, which makes me, again, feel more um, convinced of my conclusion. It's, it's very clear, and again, this has been the painful consideration and, and the, with all the continuance for me, was trying to get to the best outcome that we can get to, and I say just the best outcome, the best outcome that we can get to. And I think DOT came today to tell you out of all the options provided, this is the best outcome that they can get to. Again, you know, I didn't calculate the 0.8 times what should be feasible for five acres. If you have five acres, does that give you an unlimited amount of students or does it not? But I do know that again, that they've come down on the size or the en enrollment numbers. But I also know that there are hundreds of families, if not thousands of people, that are positively impacted by the benefit derived from their children attending this institution. And sometimes I don't think that we look at the practical element of what we do beyond just our county considerations to look at the benefit being derived. And I think that there is a benefit derived to supporting the education of our young people and the value that these institutions bring to families and the stability that they bring to communities and the hope because it's our generation that, it's our next generation that's being supported. And when I take all of that into totality, even considering the very <coughs> real concerns of the community that still, I think, should be a priority to address to the best that we can. In fact, I've heard you say that you wanted to support that in past meetings. I think that this is worth voting on today. I can vote on it today with better confidence than I could have in prior meetings, with hopefulness that you and DOT can come together and work on how to make system improvements um, to the roadway. <coughs> because it's very clear to, at this point that St. Benedict is, it's a, it's a, it's a hallmark of, of, um, of the community, and it may not necessarily be of the community immediately across from
the school, but of the greater Smyrna community and Metro or Cal, because I know that there are other families that attend. So my support or my decision today would personally be to support this application. So just some thoughts for you, because I know um, you like to be data driven. And Drew, I don't know if you can answer this question right now, but when, or Amy, when St. Benedict's, the original campus, went in, a traffic study was done, correct, I'm assuming? Since that was some time back, I would actually have to look, I'm sorry. Okay, that's, that's okay, because again, this just kind of came up with a discussion, but we're now hearing that we have trouble on Daniel Street and Cooper Lake, so my question is, is was that addressed in the original traffic study for the original school? And are some of these problems that have come up because of the school being originally built? So going back and looking what that traffic study had stated to see you know, kind of what picture that presented for the community back then and if that traffic study and what it thought was going to happen and what we have actually to kind of maybe help guide what's going to potentially be added on. I would also not mind going back and looking at that, but then also going back and looking at the school potentially doing drop off at the main campus and then finding a way to you know, bust the students over. I think there's some other things that, you know, if you are looking at supporting the school, I don't think any of us don't support a school, but as far as how we can make the two work together, um, kind of go back to the drawing board and maybe look at some other um, creative solutions to address some of the traffic concerns, and then that way it would also not be as a big of impact to the citizens in the area. You know, and just in piggybacking off of that point, Commissioner, DOT stated that they would be willing to reassess this even if the you know, suggestion would be to stagger the start time. So I think perhaps there's a way to add a condition or a stipulation that accommodates that. Yeah. And without making it so narrow that you're back here, you know, a month after you know, the school opens. Commissioner Um Just to kind of follow up, okay, just to follow up on my question earlier with respect to if the majority of the residents turn, turn left or right, um, I have an answer to that. Thank you, Amy, I appreciate that. Uh, approximately 80% of the residents out of Kensington Green turn right. But again, the reason I ask that question is because if there's a concern with traffic being stacked on Daniel, I just wanted to know what, if any additional impact that would have to the residents that are turning left onto Daniel. Um, also, with respect to the, the lot size, um, and five acres is required, and I think it's at 4.22, which, um, is a reduction of 16%. And my understanding with the original school in the slup in 2013, that that was a 60% reduction, which was um, approved at that time. Um, and uh, if I can just defer to John for any. Uh, uh, can I clarify one thing? Uh, yes. Commissioner Sheffield. The, the original school came in probably 20 years ago and it did meet the requirement. The, the one you talked about, the 60% reduction was for the, the campus of St. Benedict's that's at the corner of Cooper Lake Road and Weaver Street that came in 2013 Okay. for um, an expansion of that school. So this thing has three campuses. It's got the main campus, this campus, and then Weaver Street all along Cooper Lake Road. So when that one came in in 2013, the board approved the lot size variance to two acres on that one, which is a 60% reduction. And it should size. have been five acres. It should have been five acres. But the board, it, okay. And that one was approved for 200 students with an 11,000 square foot building. 
Okay, hold on. Let me have that num those numbers again. So it was approved for 200 students? Yes, on two acres. On two acres. And that was a 60% reduction? Correct. That was grades four, five, and six in 2013. Okay. So, <coughs> sorry, we have Commissioner Go ahead. Commissioner Sheffield's mic is lit. I know Commissioner Broll, you're responding to her, and I see Commissioner Garenbrill leaning forward. So, um, Commissioner Broll, do you have a question mm -hmm. specifically? I'm done. Okay, and then we'll have Commissioner Garenbrill. Yes. Um, so the main campus is what grades? Elementary, right? Uh, the main campus has a daycare in it and it's got elementary and one and two, I think. I would have to talk, I would have to ask uh, Reverend Brian Sullivan exactly what grades are in which building. But it, it has shifted over the years, depending on what they have available. Uh, Brian Sullivan, uh, head of school at St. Benedict's Episcopal Day School. Um, we have infants through um, second grade currently on that main campus. We added the trailers, which has a third grade component. We added uh, Danko, which has fourth grade, and our current campus that you're talking about with the two plus acres um, is fifth through eighth. So we're okay. moving the fifth through eighth campus over to the campus that we are trying to propose. And what's going to happen with that two acre property? 200 is the total. We have 180 on it now. Okay. And, and what's going to happen to it when you move the students over to the new campus? We'll move it. Uh, we'll put third and fourth grade there. Okay. So it. it basically is 120 students. So we'll reduce that campus by 80 students. So for this proposal, you'll have fifth, sixth, and seventh? Fifth, or? fifth sixth, seventh, and eighth. Okay. From 240, school. it's three sections of 20 students each. So 60 all the way through. If we can get to capacity, and most schools don't get to capacity to Amy Diaz's point, uh, we were asked to do a traffic study for the capacity, no matter whether we could get there or not. I see. And you're now at 240 for those four grades? Uh, for those four were at 280. Oh, no, uh, 180, I'm sorry. The fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth is 180. But your proposal's asking for 240. That's correct. So each uh, section right now is two. Um, we have two sections in each grade. We're, we're going to move to the new campus with extra rooms to either expand into or to add art, music, drama, and PE. Hmm. It has a STEM building in it too, and a, uh, an auditorium slash uh, lunch room. That's all I have. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Gamble? So, John, it sounds like we're going to have to modify other rezoning stipulations if um, specific parcels were already designated because it, it sounded like this two-acre parcel was designated for fourth, fifth, and sixth grades. So we're going to have to update that stipulation if they're going to move to this campus with five, six, seven, eight. It's going to change the requirements on that site. So has that also been considered? And we could take a look at that, Commissioner Gamble, but I'm not sure if the board actually said the grades in that. I know they stipulated the site plan, the access, and the number of students. But if it's something that St. Benedict's needs to amend to address, then we can do that down the road. That's a separate one. We should definitely look into whether or not that was a stipulated okay. zoning approval. I, I can add the plan at the time was to expand through eighth grade onto that campus. Okay. Yeah, Commissioner Gamble. So I know you have plans to expand to eighth grade. Do you have exp plans to expand into the high school? No. Not unless it's way off campus. It won't be in this area. <laughs> high school creates all kinds of field play, stadium lighting, and all that kind of thing. Any other comments? 
appreciate everyone's thoughts on this one. All right. Considering that everything boils down to the traffic plan, the improvements, and the timelines under consideration, that's where I'll focus the crux of additional stipulations on this, um, on this zoning. So. Is that her finish? Is there a question? Or we, we always have time for just a second. Okay. You're, you're in the middle of your thoughts. Thank you. Um, I appreciate everyone's, as, as to echo what the chair had stated, you know, it is, it is a balance, um, but also noting what are the different location opportunities for an educational institution and what are the restrictions that are offered and available with those different parcels. Um, it is certainly my intent, regardless of the zoning on this, that those, uh, that, that entire area has already been noted as an area of focus for this upcoming year. So we are looking at systemic improvements and what that can mean in order to support that from a financial standpoint as well. Um, and I think you heard a little bit of it in DOT's portion of the interview, or the questions. Um, I also appreciate that the school is so willing to work with the community and um, partner in a way that can be amenable for all parties. Um, there's still a long way to go on this, on the details of this. But with everything that has been presented thus far, I will motion to approve. Let's, let's have her conclude her motion, please. Thank you. Without With, interruption. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Commissioner Richard, if I can just interrupt real briefly. Please. Remember, we have two different motions, so there's for, two different ones. We don't yes, mind. for Z78. Um, with all, all restrictions called out in the stipulation, the most recent stipulation letter, um, additional stipulation with regards to lighting, no stadium lighting by the field, that um, during the time period in which there is no construction um, or no build, that there is certainly maintenance of the land. That no other, that ever, and this is already a step, but to reiterate that no other, all other phases need to be brought back to this board. The final site plan needs to be approved by the district commissioner, along with elevations. That a final carpool plan needs to be approved by the district commissioner. And I may need DOT's help on this, but with regards to no parking signs, if that is included for Daniel Street, no parking standing or stopping. That this is restricted to, restricted to middle school grades. All staff comments, including DOT's recent list of comments, not in conflict with anything else. I'll second it. Is there any discussion? Commissioner uh, Sheffield. Can, can, 
Can I just for a clarification? I'm sorry for that. You, you said most recent stipulation letter. Can we have a date and from, who's the I think author? It was, was August please? 10th, but I need clarification okay. on that. From Mr. For August 10th for Mr. Moore. Is that correct? For August 10th for Mr. Moore. Yes. Okay. And also, you mentioned the stop signs. That would that um, that have to come back as a separate a separate matter before the board. Uh, would that be instructions to DOT to look at that and, and to bring it back if it's appropriate? Correct. Okay. Correct. That's really, that's, yeah, that's related to the no parking. What's that? The no standing, no stopping, no parking would be relation to them bringing it back if it was needed for the carpool lamp. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Commissioner Sheffield. I think those are all. Commissioner Richardson, you mentioned uh, the construction of the site. Can um, would you consider restricting hours to the construction? Hours, oh, okay. Um, what are our normal? Is it, I think it's nine a.m. Seven. Seven. Someone can tell me what the normal Seven construction. Seven a.m. to six p.m. Seven a.m. to six p.m. Okay, and stipulated limited seven a.m. to six p.m. for construction hours. Monday through Saturday. Thank you. Commissioner Sheffield, if that concludes your Commissioner Thank Ball. You. Um, when Drew and Amy were up here, they said with the new revised traffic plan and um, access configuration that DOT appro recommended approval of that. The, with the new revised site plan and traffic plan that um, from the August 10th letter, I guess, does staff recommend approval on the new revisions? For the traffic, for the traffic circulation plan only? For the site plan and everything that was revised. Well, well staff had originally uh, uh, recommended approval when it was a little bit more intense than this. Right. So we would be fine with, with them lessening with their most current letter and plan. Okay. And um, <clears throat> I know we asked this or and discussed it, but um, would the applicant be willing to look at bus service to mitigate individual private vehicles dropping off? I'm just going to include that in the scope of the carpool plan. Okay. I didn't know if you wanted to ask or not. Commissioner Gamble, did you have any other comments? Commissioner Richardson, I have a couple. Yes. Yeah. Uh, one, I would just ask that uh, you not stipulate the middle school grades only because theirs is already non-traditional fifth through eighth. Mm -hmm. And really, I think the dominant interest is the max capacity of students, not yeah. necessarily the grades. And then um, a question regarding the lights at the school. Um, considering particularly in the fall and winter, it gets dark very early. And when school gets out, um, I would maybe ask for you to have um, lights that are hooded and that um, are, there's some specific language we sometimes put in our stipulations when we have um, lighting around fields, only because if you look at the plan, the field isn't necessarily right next to residential. Mm -hmm. They moved it towards the O and I, so it's likely that what's there is not gonna be operating in the evening. I would just ask still if you're concerned about the shining of light to the residential area that's a little bit northwest. Mm -hmm. Perhaps you get hooded lights, and again, there's another stipulation we have. That Maybe we could add language that states that all site lighting to be environmentally sensitive okay. with shields and district commissioner to approve the final lighting plan. That sounds wonderful. That sound perfect? <laughs> <laughs> I could not write that fast enough. Look, is, is that for parking in the parking lot? Oh, it's 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 too. No, you um, add I mean, for that's, um, are you allowing light a lighted field now? No, so no stadium lights, just for the specificity of mm, that. Right, but street lights for Parking. Yeah, I'm speaking about the field too, mm -hmm. just because it is going to limit their hours and just um, 
looking at where the field is going to be placed on the site plan is not immediately towards residential. It's the ONI site that's north of it. Well, I would specify no stadium lights. I did. That was it. That's why I'm asking. Okay. And, I, and, and perhaps my yes is that you. I don't know the difference between stadium and I'm presuming the stadium lights refers to the lighting that's on the field. So um, I would just ask that whatever lighting is on the field, it may, I don't know if you have to call it something other than stadium lights for them to have lighting on the field, but I just would encourage you to allow lighting on the field. Correct. That's the step that we Okay, that we perfect. Did. Okay. So, and that'll extend for the whole property, that language. Okay. Um, okay, great. And um, with regards to the the total capacity, that one's already that's already a stipulation, I believe. Yeah. So we'll just remove the description of the middle school grades. And I did mean to add for the uh, final landscaping plans also come back along with art architectural renderings. Okay. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? We'll call the question. The motion passes 3-2 with Commissioners Burl and Gamble in opposition. Okay. With that, we'll go ahead and take, yeah. I'm sorry, we have the slup. I'm sorry. We have the slup. Thank you. I wonder why we're so anticlimactic. <laughs> Second uh, motion here is SLEP 11, a uh, motion to approve with all previous <laughs> restrictions on there um, and staff comments, recommendations. Not other ones. All, all the same, could, could we say all the same conditions that yes. you had for Z78 and yes. stipulations? Okay. Thank you. Cal second, is there any discussion? Call the question. The motion passes 3-2. All right, thank you, commissioners. Let's go ahead and take a 10-minute break till 1120.
Hello and welcome back to our Board of Commissioners zoning hearing. We will be continuing uh, with our zoning agenda. Um, John, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. And uh, Madam Chair and Board, there is one more re uh, request to continue one of your other business cases. Okay. Uh, the applicant would like to continue other business item number 39 of 2022, E-Rock Development, LLC. Uh, there are some development issues that, the, the, that he needs to sit down and, and talk to our DFT about regarding that. Okay. Uh, this is an application where he's asking to go from public roads to private roads. So we need to have a conversation with the applicant before the board hears it, I believe. Thank you. Commissioner Burrell. Thank you. Um, this will be staff recommending continuance. Okay, I make a motion to continue other business 39. Second. Is there any discussion? Uh, till, till when, I'm sorry. S September um, 20th. Till the September 20th signing. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Call the question. The motion passes 5 0. Okay, next case is LUP 13, Carol J. Hicks Vargas. Uh, Michael Vargas requests a temporary land use permit to allow more adults in vehicles than the county code allows in land lot 80 of the 16th district. The property is located on the southwest side of Rocky Top Court, north of Watkins Glen Drive. Is the applicant present? Let the record show the applicant is here. Is there anyone here opposed to LEP 13? No. Let the record show there's no one opposed. Would the applicant please come forward to be sworn in? I'm gonna take a personal point of privilege. Um, Ms. Janine, can you help me in reaching out to property management? The air is blowing in here, oh, and it's, yes, it's quite cold. Thank you. Ma'am, you may proceed whenever you're ready. If you can help in just stating your name for the record, please. Yes, um, my name is Carol Hicks Vargas. Um, I'm the owner of the home on Rocky Top Court. Um, we purchased the home about 16 years ago. I'm the mother of six children. Um, we specifically researched and looked for the area that we wanted to purchase um, and decided Cobb County was diverse and matched our household and our beliefs. <laughs> Um, we purchased the home for this specific situation that we're in now. Um, of the three children, I have three that were adults when we purchased the home 16 years ago, and three that were younger, all of special needs. Um, our goal was to make sure that the home had enough room to be able to continue my three younger to live with us till they were not needing to live with us anymore. The home is five bedrooms. It has two master bedrooms. My husband and I have one. Uh, our secondary caregivers are my adult son and his wife, and they live in the second master bedroom. And then there's three additional bedrooms, and each of those are my three younger children. Um, they're all now adults, so there's a total of seven of us uh, living in a five-bedroom home. We are just short of the amount of square footage, according to the law, um, uh, to fit in the home. Even though we have an eat-in kitchen, we have a living room, we have a dining room, and we have five bedrooms. Like I said, two of them are masters. Um, so for us living in the space, we have plenty of space. It's a larger lot. We're one of the largest lots in the area that I live. We have a very, very large driveway, a very, very long driveway, and I live on a court. Um, so that's the basic information. Thank you. Appreciate it. That I'm going to turn things over to you, Commissioner. Okay. No opposition. There was no opposition when she originally spoke. Are there anyone here in opposition? Okay, ma'am, you can have a seat and, unless the Commissioner calls you back up. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, well, Ms. Vargas, can, can you come back up? I'm sorry. <laughs> um, 
first of all, staff, this was a result of code enforcement complaint? Yes. Okay. Have, have you talked to your neighbors? All my neighbors. In fact, actually, the entire court knows us, but I also brought it up to all of our community. Our, we, our housing tract is actually split into two with the freeway in between. Um, but we have great communication, and I spoke to all of them. And after having to prove to them that this was real and that I really had to do all of this because everyone was in such shock and couldn't believe that I had to go through this process, they're like, well, you're all related. That's not what the law says. Um, there has been no opposition. Um, everybody on the court doesn't have a problem with it. Everybody who knows us doesn't have a problem with it. Um, we're not people who have loud parties. We're not outside, you know, blowing horns or doing any of these kinds of things. Um, uh, but like I said, I did check with everyone uh, to make sure. There is only one homeowner who refused to sign, and it's because he's a out-of-state landowner. So I did exactly what I was told to do. I communicated with this property management who said they would love to sign off on it, but that's not their responsibility. They spoke to the owner several times, and basically, unless it has anything to do with monetary value for him, he wasn't interested in having anything to do with it. Okay. And um, you are allowed five adults and one outside john according he's allowed uh, five adults and four cars parked outside right uh do you have a carport or garage no okay um can can you um well so you have three adult children and three with special needs yes okay so the children aren't if they're but under 18 they're not they're now in the number of adults they're all they're all 18 the last one just turned 18 while we were doing this okay. process oh boy <laughs> so um can you keep all seven cars in your driveway oh definitely my driveway is um you're only allowed it's, four it's, uh, exactly outside. yeah but you could very very easily fit double that number my driveway my house is set back from the street and my driveway is the full length um uh, of the yard the house and is comes it's wider it can actually fit three cars across for the full length of the house. Okay. I, I, I see your hardship and your, you know, request for an exemption. Um, I don't want to set a precedent because we have a lot of issues with unrelated that are, that have um, cars and overnight guests and, um, and I also don't want to impact the community with multiple cars, especially on the street. Um, I believe Planning Commission recommended denial, and what is staff's recommendation? The staff, recommend, uh, the staff rec uh, uh, recommendation was for denial also, uh, Commissioner Burrell. Uh, this is gonna be a tough one. <laughs> Uh, is there any way you can get by, do all the, all the children that are eight, over 18 have a car? You, you, your husband, it, it, your son and daughter-in-law, and then. And my husband has a, a work truck too. So is the, is the bit, can I ask a question? I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Is the biggest concern is the parking of the cars? Well, that, as far as impacting your neighbors, if they're on the street or what have you, but also you're in violation of the dwelling code of the 390 feet um, per, per mm -hmm. adult. So 
but that's why you're before us to ask for a land use permit <laughs> to accommodate that. So um, are, do you have any plans of um, a larger house or another moving in the future? We weren't planning on moving, no. We actually like our neighborhood and like our community and, and like liked our house but our option is if you deny it is that i'm going to have to let the house go and we've got a lot of um emotional connection to the house and and, and to the area but i mean that would be what we would have to do do you have room to add on we have an unfinished utility storage room that would still make us just short I believe but we and we looked at that or, or right on we I looked at that option and we talked about that with um, code enforcement um, the, the problem is is, is the cost um, the main cost would be putting in the drop-in ceiling okay do you have a basement no no okay no it's all living space it's what they call a tri-level because you come in at a different level. Okay. And will you agree to keep all the cars, even though you're only allowed four for this exception, keep all the cars in the driveway and not on the street? Yes, if that's what's required. Um, to be honest, my, aunt, my neighbors asked what they could do all of my neighbors in my court and said if we have to park a car in front of their house whatever would work that they are all willing to do that um, for okay. us do you you have a you have submitted a signed petition from the neighbors? yes then these are but the neighbors that that petition only needed to have the neighbors that were connected to your property right so but we physically went and talked to all the other neighbors across the street in our court um, and the court behind us. Okay. Um, I'm ready to make a motion. Um, I'm going to make a motion to approve lot 13 due to the hardship and situation and all being related. Um, make an exception for the four, four cars outside to be seven cars, but they must be in the driveway, not on the street. I can do that, can I? Okay. Um, and I'm gonna just do it for 20, for 12 months, and then ask you to come back in a year, and we'll see how it goes, and if we've had any complaints, and, and discuss renewal at that time. Okay? Okay, thank you. So that's my motion. I'll second it. Is there any discussion? Mm -hmm. Commissioner Gambrell and then oh, cool. Commissioner Sheffield. Uh, Ms. Vargas, I have, a, I have a clarification question for you. Yes. So the seven adults. Yes. Three of them are your special needs children. Yes, 18, 19, and 21. Okay. Do those special need children have vehicles? Two, one of them does right now, yes, the 21-year-old. Okay, so that takes us to five, and then you said your husband has an additional vehicle, so that's yes. six. So, so I only have six right now, yes, because we had two, we, we, we had an accident recently with one of them, but yes, so. So you really only have a need I for only have six, six right vehicles. Now. Yes, that's right. And, and where I'm struggling with the hardship part of it is um, you state you have three special needs children that need the other in, two individuals to stay there to help give care, you, but yes. they're driving. The 21-year-old is, yes, believe it or not, yes. So, so that's where I'm kind of struggling with the hardship there if if they are, you know, I know there's different levels of special needs, but if they are eligible to be able to go out and drive, how much do they need a caregiver to care for them while they're in the house? That's where I'm struggling with this application. And also, you did not show up to the planning commission meeting. Can you yes, explain why? My, yes, that's correct. And I did call on that day. 
my daughter had been in the, we were in the hospital for 11 days and I messed up on the timing and I had the timing wrong. Sorry. Oh. I know it's your application. Um, I said Commissioner Sheffield will go next, oh, but are you I'm okay sorry. if Commissioner yeah, Burrell sure. inter... No, 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 Go ahead. It's your... I, I just wanted to ask, so are you okay with a maximum of six cars? That's fine. <laughs> okay. So I'll make that part of my motion. Um, I, you know, I, I'll make it a maximum of six outside in the driveway. Commissioner Sheffield. Thank you. I just still need a little clarification on um, who's driving which vehicles. Um, so currently you have six vehicles at the home. One is driven by the 20 year old. Yes, the tw tw he just turned 21, yes. Okay. And he um, does have special needs and we're working on, but him hit driving is a huge okay. accomplishment. Okay, so child. And for the other five, can you just kind of Yeah, I have a car. My husband has a vehicle, and a personal work. vehicle. Um, my daughter-in-law has a personal vehicle. And, and she, pardon the interruption, but she's one of the five adults? Yes. Just for clarification? Yes. Okay. And then my son, my oldest son, who is my secondary caregiver, um, has a vehicle. So okay. it's my, my husband and myself and then uh, my son and his wife. So we all each have a car. And okay. your husband and then, has a work. And then my husband has a work vehicle, yes. That's the seven. Or six. So for the sixth one is which vehicle? Your husband's work vehicle? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Number six, sorry. Okay. Is but that's not the one that was um, um, in the in the accident that you're no. looking to replace. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Richardson, excuse me, ma'am, I'm not sure if the commissioner has another I don't question. have a question. I'm sorry, she doesn't have a question. Okay. We should Thank just you. put a chair right there. <laughs> well, I, I still have one. Okay. Um, I just, I need some clarification because I, I perceive that this is very similar to a case we've just denied. And I'm trying to understand the difference between the two cases. What? An individual who was facing hardship needed additional cars and came in for a temporary land use as well. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, well, can you come back up? Um, the, the difference, I think, is this is a family and they're all related. And the caregivers are you and your husband and your oldest son and his wife. That's correct. You don't have outside caregivers coming in or no. or no. a business. We you're would not prefer running, not to do that. You're yes. not a daycare or whatever. It's just for your own family. Yes. Um, and they're all your per, your personal or your husband's work vehicle that are yes. yes. involved. Yes, we don't have an employee. We don't have a nurse coming in. We would prefer our family to take care of our own family. I, I just feel that there's a hardship with the family. Oh. Yeah, in the previous, they were all related as well. It, mm -hmm. and, and I'm not, because this, it's this obviously a different case, like it's a separate case, but I'm just trying to reconcile yeah. the difference. I know, and, and I normally the, don't the, well, the, the, allow this, well, but. What was discussed at that point, <laughs> which I still am of the opinion, is the code itself has to be addressed, and there is currently um, I know we're looking into it to be addressed over a time period. And so even though it was granted a denial, there was a time period given to that applicant to, to become compliant, mm -hmm. right. by which fell within the time frame that that code could be addressed. Mm -hmm. um, I'm still of, I, it, it, unless like I, I'm just struggling to hear a real differentiation, but that's, I wanted clarification from you, so I appreciate that. Are there any other additional comments or questions? 
commissioners, I'll just share or reiterate a point that I made during the last zoning matter. There is a real practical element to the work that we do. These are real people. We, enough of us have acknowledged that our code probably needs to be looked at and modified. That's a technicality. What's before us is a real person. People need to live. People need places to live. I just heard yesterday on the news that the median price for a new home in Metro Atlanta went down this month to $422,000. circumstances surrounding these applications today are very different than the circumstances surrounding applications when that code restriction of 390 square feet per person was put in place. So to just think somebody's just to pick up and move because their family is growing, people are struggling just to even live where they are, let alone to find a new place. I bet you even if she did pick up and find a new place, she's not going to get it for what she paid for this place for. I know there's a desire to perhaps reconcile or be consistent. I'm just asking for you to honor the motion because we're, I think Commissioner Burrell's considering this person, this is a real person. I'm not aware of there needing to be a hardship requirement for a LUP. We usually ask for, and maybe this is being made akin to a variance. Variance is often a consideration for hardship, but this is a land use permit, but what we can consider multiple circumstances be to look beyond the code. Hmm. I'm in support of, of um, this. 12 months I think could give you enough time to see if this is still out of hand. She's, this is a real person who actually talked to real neighbors to get support. She has a petition just like the last application had a petition and the last application had more signatures in support. This is a person that went and talked to their neighbors. They have their support, that has real people living with her, and real people are having a really hard time finding a place to live right now. So I just ask for us to give consideration for the motion at hand. I'll call the question. I'm sorry. If I, if I may, maybe I didn't hear it. I, I heard the number of cars, but I did not hear. The, That's number six. Right, but, but I didn't hear the, I didn't hear re regarding the number of people that are allowed to be living in the house. Those seven that are there now. Okay, the seven that are there. No more than those those seven. Okay. That are related. That are related. Seven okay. related that are there now. All right. And no parking on the street. All cars in the driveway. Maximum of six. For one year. May I ask a follow-up hmm? question? May I ask a follow-up question? Sure. Yeah. I, um, I thought I called the question, but okay. Did I not call the question? Yes, but so I, I'm clarify. asking. Did I call? I'm asking. I don't. <laughs> you did. I did I keep the question? Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's appropriate then to go back for a discussion. Unless, That's fine. Yeah. Okay. All right. Call the question. Yeah. The motion passes three-two with Commissioner Sheffield and Gamble in opposition. Okay, moving into the other business agenda. Uh, first case is other business item number 22, which is to consider a site plan and stipulation amendment for Robert A. Kerr and Rancho Kerr regarding rezoning application Z51 of 2013. The property is located on the north side of Rosa Road, west of Robert Lane, in land lots 961, 984, and 985 of the 16th District. By way of background, Madam Chair and Board, the subject property was rezoned to R1506C in 2013 for a 21 lot single family detached sub uh, open space subdivision. The applicant would like to amend the approved site plan and stipulations to allow a 0 0.08 acres of the open space to be sold and placed into a private lot, which is lot number six, the applicant's lot. The homeowner of lot number six has already gone into the open space with clearing and grading and has placed landscaping and retaining wall in the open space. This, re this re request is the result of a code enforcement complaint from November 5th, 2021. 
The applicant has submitted uh, approval of the request from their HOA. If approved, all previous conditions should remain in effect. The applicant is here. Is there anyone here opposed to other business item number 22? No. Okay. Are you opposed or? Okay. Yeah. Dr. Record, so there's two people here opposed to other business item number 22. All those wishing to address the board, please come forward to be sworn in. Thank you again, Madam Chair uh, and Commissioners. Kevin Moore here on behalf of Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Kerr uh, in this application. And we've heard this now, I think a couple of times, um, in their request uh, to try to address what has happened. Uh, and uh, first and foremost, we have revised the request. The initial request to come to you for, for other business was uh, their request to take the area that had uh, been designated as open space for the OSC community that was uh, directly behind their house and lot uh, and be able to take it out of being designated as open space so that it could be transferred to them and so it could be privately owned. Uh, and since that time though and through a number of discussions that we have had uh, primarily with um, uh, various uh, county staff uh, we have revised that proposal. Uh, that proposal was in zoning speak, we deleted the proposal down from, from that to asking simply that uh, the board approve the uh, open space area to have uh, uh, landscaping as well as the small retaining wall uh, located in the open space. Uh, we have deleted and removed our request and the CURS request to have the property uh, taken out of open space or to be allowed to be transferred to them. With this request, it would remain open space. Uh, it just allows for the landscaping that was put in there and paid for by the curs, and for the small retaining wall that was paid for and put in there by the curs to just simply remain. Uh, one of the things that has struck us, and specifically me, about this case all along is knowing that the difficulty of the situation. Uh, these homeowners, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Kerr, if you recall, when they came to buy this house, and they were meeting with a developer slash builder out there a lot while their house was being built. They were walked out to the back fence. And you can see it, just, that is their house. They were walked out to the back fence and he even showed them where the uh, iron pin was. And it was spray painted orange back there. He said, that's your property corner. Took them out to the back, to the fence line, um, but to show them where the property was. That was not correct. That, their property is 30 feet short of that. Um, could they have looked at the recorded plat for the subdivision to determine that and seen that? They could have. Uh, and they acknowledged that and they own that. But it's also something, unless you live in this world, that's not something you know to do necessarily. Especially if somebody who's selling you the, 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 the house uh, in a, what is it, a, a subdivision uh, shows you where that is. Um, and in fact, they were given the number uh, of the landscape company to use. Uh, to do this work. In addition, please understand that the type of natural space that was there, being only 30 feet wide, was full of scrub. Uh, it was not uh, uh, any type of vegetation uh, that was necessarily worth saving uh, or worth keeping. It served no purpose other than, sure, it provides, quote, connectivity uh, around the subdivision, but it also provides a 30 foot wide path behind people's houses, but it didn't serve a purpose in terms of uh, anything more than holding the world together. Uh, what they have done uh, with what they installed is like actually is far better from a visual standpoint, from a future buffer standpoint, from a future tree standpoint. It is a lot better. And part of what we have tried to do here is I think try to find what is the fair result uh, what is the best result? What is the fair result? Taking into, into account the considerations that you have to go through. You have to consider not just the curves. You have to consider precedent. You have to consider how is this going to turn or what's going to need to happen. And so what we have tried to do with this request now is turn this so that 
at least the, the Kurds are not getting what they asked for. They understand that. They're not getting what they think you know, they ought to get. I mean, we, we find ourselves in that position often, and they understand that. Uh, but what I would hate to see happen is that they are the ones who end up being punished by a decision that means that the landscaping that looks very nice and, is, and, and very consistent, uh, that has a very nice retaining wall as part of it, is just ripped out. And so that the only people that fall to the wayside or who have to fall on the sword here are the curs. And I simply don't think that's the right result. And I, and I hope you would agree that that is not the right result. Again, there's the picture. Um, so you, that's taken from, again, from their deck. You can see that in the lower right-hand portion of the picture. So you can see just how close this was and, and why it could have occurred or unfolded this way. Now, throughout this process, two things should have happened. Um, one, there should, there should have been, as part of the zoning, underlying zoning stipulations for this subdivision, the open space was supposed to have been conveyed and transferred as a conservation easement to the county. That has not been done. Okay, so that was not checked off at any point in time to as a zoning condition that should have occurred. Number two, your OSC does uh, regulations do provide for signage or fencing. Something has to demark, uh, identify that you're in an open space area, and that's part of your OSC regulations. And that's also not present here. Neither one of which can the curs do. They do not own that open space property. So they cannot do either one of those things. Um, our recommendation, and we've reached out to the owner of that property, uh, of the open space, who would, who would be the quote developer now, that is, uh, and uh, had a conversation and have begun to have conversations about uh, them stepping in to provide a more subdivision wide solution that can address some of the, well, what happens if future homeowners along the same stretch want to do the same thing? Well, we think that can be addressed, but not by us. Regardless of what happens here, the situation should be addressed and resolved to have the conservation easement put in place so that that transfer occurs and some signage placed by the, uh, by the uh, developer or some other subdivision-wide solution for this particular issue. But we can't do that. The curves can't do that. And so what we're trying to encourage with this request at this point in time is let's put that in place. Community de development can be directed. Uh, code enforcement can be directed uh, to ensure that uh, zoning conditions are being satisfied and can be satisfied, which we believe will lead uh, to a solution that is fair as fair can be to the curves in this situation, to a solution that uh, preserves your sense of precedent, uh, as well as preserves uh, the county's interest in policy in seeing that its open space communities retain their open space and that the zoning conditions that are put in place are met and satisfied uh, going forward. Uh, for that reason, that's why we are asking simply that the landscaping and that wall remain and that's the only approval that we're looking for at this time. Uh, we're not asking for the open space to be changed, redesignated, or conveyed to the curves whatsoever. They understand that's not a possibility for them here uh, under the current proposal. And so with that, I'm here. I can answer any questions that you may have, uh, but would uh, respectfully request your approval of our deleted request in this regard. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now hear from opposition. Chris Lindstrom representing the East Cup Civic Association. Thank you, and Chris. Can you speak a little bit closer to the mic? Thank you. I do that each time. I apologize. <laughs> it's all right. uh, I'm Chris Lindstrom representing the East Cup Civic Association and one of the case managers for OB22. Since our meeting last month, the only thing that has happened is that the applicant submitted a stipulation letter to Cobb County dated August 10th. Uh, 2022, and in that letter, he deletes the request to purchase the property and asks that landscaping and wall remain to the OSC property as built. 
the new request does nothing to restore the continuity of the OSC space to the community. It still looks like the applicant owns the property and will encourage other neighbors on their street to do the same thing to their property. If they can do it, why can't we? ECCA is unaware of any extenuating circumstances that would not have allowed the applicant to address any drainage issues within their own yard rather than modify the OSC property. The current stipulation letter still defeats the pur purpose of protecting a dedicated area of land in its natural state. If allowed, this not only gives permission but now encourages every home backing up to an OSC property to landscape and build structure, structures. So what's the point of OSC coding if it is not upheld and respected? ECCA believes that allowing landscaping and building upon designated open space is counter to the intention of the Cobb County OSC code and most importantly, sets a negative precedent for future OSC zoning cases within Cobb County. ECCA does recommend denial of OB 22 and that the OSC space be restored to its natural, to its original state, including the removal of the wall. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other speakers in opposition? All right, with that, um, John, I'll ask for what staff recommendation is. Uh, Madam Chair and Board, the, the staff uh, is totally against conveying this 0 0.08 acres fee simple to the owner. We, we don't think that would be a good precedent. It would cause a break in the continuity of the open space. Um, we do understand their problem, and the staff wouldn't be opposed to them keeping the wall but replanning the entire 30 foot buffer to county standards. It's, it's kind of a compromise. You know, they, they can leave the wall, it's in. It probably causes more damage taking it out than leaving it in. But just go back and replant the buffer so it's a full 30 foot buffer where it should be. Okay, thank you. Turn things over to Commissioner Richardson. Thank you. Um, and then I know in our last one we had an open question about stormwater and drainage. So, Carl, can you <clears throat> come up? Carl Carver, Cup County Stormwater. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, and I know there, it, there was an email correspondence about what the findings were with regards to this case. Perhaps you can just enlighten everybody on the board. Uh, correct. The, the fence line is the ridge line. And so there is drainage behind the wall and the um, pipe behind the wall is there for the structural integrity of the wall. The, the infiltration from that area behind the wall, uh, the drainage from there will weep down to that pipe and it discharges at the end of the wall and then drains in a shallow swell to the street, to the front. Uh, that's what those lots are intended to drain uh, so that the impervious area from those lots on that side of the street are draining to the street so they go to the detention pond. Thank you, and so the wall doesn't present any real stormwater value, stormwater management value? It it catches what's behind it because it's going to infiltrate and get to that. Uh, but that is a standard practice for that type of wall to have that type of foundation drain. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, oh. Hi, Carl. So um, there is a drainage issue, the reason for the wall. I don't think it's an issue. That's a standard practice for that type of wall to have a foundation drain. The, the ridge line is the fence line. So okay. the only drainage area that's going behind the wall is what's between the wall and the fence. A very small area. Yeah. But is it any runoff to the sides to impact the neighbors on either side or behind? No. No, it, it, it runs towards the wall and then to the, to the left and right. Uh, the back corner that you see where there's a, kind of a cluster of trees and one tall tree, that 
the, it breaks and starts going the other direction, and then it comes forward towards the wall and then behind the wall and discharges at the end of the wall and then goes into a shallow swell between their house and what will be a house on the next door neighbor. Okay, so it's not gonna affect the neighbors on either side. And staff is recommending planting trees in front of the wall for the open space part, the 30 feet as well, along, just along the length of the wall. It'd be along the length that was disturbed. Uh, it was just shown on their plat in the other business packet. Where the wall is? Yeah. Okay. That's all I had, Carl. Thank you. Any other questions for Carl? Okay. Thank you. Um, and so I know that there was an open question with the conservation easement. Sounds like that hadn't been done. What is what is that? But that's correct. The developer has not filed the conservation easement. The last we checked on it was Friday, unless they've done it between now and, and then. So uh, obviously it would be a recommendation that at, uh, that at the very least that uh, ComDev contact the, um, the developer and pursue <coughs> them having to actually file the conservation easement, which is a requirement of the zoning condition. And, and just to add on to that, Commissioner and Board, uh, Phil Westbrook from our planning department has been in contact with the owner of the open space and he is trying to get that work through right now. Okay. All right. And the developer, I'm assuming, is trying to keep the open space as shown on the plat? It, it's going to be as shown on the approved site plan by the Board of Commissioners. Okay. So can we go back to the GIS map that you had up and then zoom out a little bit? So um, John and Bill, in regards to that question, the couple of homes, um, I guess it was better seen if we can zoom in. So the two homes to the south of the Kerrs, if you carefully look, they've constructed walls in the area that should also be the buffer. And the one house actually has their not, fence no going up. It, okay, from the GIS, it appears <laughs> that the fence is going into the buffer. Yep, here, this is good, you can see this. If I'm looking at the site plan that was approved, that was all supposed to be an undisturbed buffer, and I'm assuming open space as well. So, these two homes mm -hmm. are technically also in violation. No. No. Uh, lots so, four and five don't have the open space buffer behind them. Behind them is the detention pond for the subdivision behind them. Okay, so John, but this is the picture that I'm looking at yeah, that was included. You, 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 want look, you want to look at this one? Yeah, the actual site plan and yeah, not, actual not site the plan. rendering. Okay, so I don't have that actual site plan in my binder. So my, but my question is, is the other two homes, um, have they encroached on mm -mm. the open space buffer? Mm -mm. No. Yeah, lots okay. four and five don't appear to be encroaching. Okay. All right, thank you. Other question? John, OSC restrictions, do they, it, them not being owned by the property owner, right? Is it, is it just where trees have to, like it's just, it's, there's no structure at all, right? I think we read. It, this specific subdivision with these conditions, it is shown as a 30 foot open space with a conservation easement. Now. The minutes don't say if it's disturbed or undisturbed the landscape. It just says 30 foot open space conservation mm -hmm. area. Um, okay. it, it was the second part of your question, Commissioner? I think it was a complex question. <laughs> it's yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah, the structure. Oh, structures? Okay. In, in Garvis Sam's letter, when this was submitted on page number three, stipulation number 11, the last part of it says uh, open space exists 
to the rear of the respective properties and cannot be built upon. So we took the retaining walls being built upon. I may add, Commissioner, there are some times um, <coughs> conditions for open space community where that could be a park for the community. So you might sometimes see it landscaped similarly without the wall, but you'll see it grassed out. Um, but I perceive from the stipulation you just read, John, that this is different. That, well, it doesn't necessarily say it can't, that can't happen. It's just saying no, nothing is to be built on that. That's correct. Land, yeah. I'm trying to reserve my comments for after we do a, a motion in a second. I would find it very difficult to keep the wall in place. Even I say from a practical perspective that if they were to plant the trees and it grows up, I can see some some child my, running my into youngest it. child running through the trees and just not seeing the wall after it grows up. It's just <laughs> you know, this frog, you know. I just think it's a safety hazard to grow trees in front, and grow trees in back, and then have that wall remaining in place. Because it's not, it's not going to be clear if you're running all through back there. That that's there. And this is just a, it's related but not related question. Oh, I forgot. Sorry, I'll have to come back to it. What were you going to say? No, you can, I, I, I mean, I'm open to the commentary on this. <laughs> Sherry, if you have a question or follow yes, up. Um, I, I guess maybe this would be a question for Carl. Hey, Carl. Hey, Carl Carver. My question is, if the wall is removed, would the um, stormwater infrastructure, the piping, would that also be removed? Yes, it would really be no need for it at that time. Okay. It, it, the, the, the pipe behind the wall is to keep the from having from a hydrostatic pump. load behind the wall. Right, okay. So with it being there, does that add any additional stormwater protection or no? It, protects the resident somewhat because it it stops any of any runoff that's between the wall and the fence is mm -hmm. infiltrating behind the wall and then coming out on, at their side property line where it needs to okay if we don't have the wall then you know they'll have to grade and plant in a way that allows the drainage mm -hmm. from that to go around their house okay all right that was my second question so um thank you mm -hmm. And I'm sorry, Commissioner Burley, did you have a comment? Not now. Hey, yeah, man. Commissioner, I just, and maybe help me, Commissioner Richardson or John, from a practical perspective, the developer, they're involved in the zoning process, or I'm presuming the developer was involved in the zoning process? Uh, that's correct, and the developer did sign this other business application. It's just a very, I mean, I understand staff's recommendation. It's just very difficult to support a request when the developer should have known that should have been open space. And, you know, perhaps there could have been some other mitigating aspects for stormwater flow around the house, but I don't know. I, I strongly support staff's recommendation and opposition. This is just, and the acquiescence of the applicant that this is just not a good precedent. Um, just to um, offer some suggestions here. One of the things that we're seeing, and I know this is happening a lot in my district, is again where when they go to develop the properties, they are dropping them significantly which is causing that homeowner and also the adjacent homeowner issues when water starts to run and erode, erode the, um, oh, the name just, 
help me, John, what's the name of it? The um, slope, there we go. It starts to erode the slope that is created in order to allow the construction to happen. I understand the need for this wall, just as the wall on the next two adjacent properties are there because of the drop that they did in the parcel. So in order to protect not only losing the adjacent property but their own land, I understand the construction of the wall. From there, um, wall number 11 in the stipulation state that the open space exists to the rear of their respective properties and cannot be built upon. If you look at stipulation number 12, which discusses the conservation easement, okay, and then it needs to be recorded, and again, we need to get that recorded. It also then, in the last sentence, says that additionally, accordingly to the OSC regulations, pedestrian easements entrances shall be indicated with signage at access points. So <coughs> the open space also knew that there could potentially be trails back there. So I guess if additional trees are going to be planted, I would think that the property owner would want to do it adjacent to their property line to kind of create that natural path to guide people on that would keep them between the wall and the trees, if that is the intent of the community. Because I guess this is where the open space kind of leaves some flexibility is if the community wants to put that walking path in there. So, it, you know, it sounds like we need to get the developer back in, get him to record the conservation easement, and then determine if he's going to put the walking path in to then determine what kind of landscaping, if that was what you were going to prove the homeowner would need to do, if that helps. I think they need to move the wall. I, I think I agree. This was a comment shared. I will reiterate it because I su support consideration for them removing the wall. Um, Carl, I'm sorry. Can I ask Carl back up? I know this is. Carl, do you mind coming back up? I just, I'm going to beat this dead horse one more time. <laughs> I'm not real. <laughs> Yes, yes. ma'am. Uh, did you provide that the drainage system behind the wall is to keep water from pulling up along the wall, or does it have other benefit? It it really doesn't pull up behind the wall. Okay. Uh, it there's whatever falls on the surface behind the wall is infiltrating uh, the ground, and then coming out at the end of the pipe. But there's very little area. Like I said, the fence line is the ridge. So at the fence, between the fence and the wall is the only area draining behind the wall. At the, at the fence line for the property behind them, it's going the other directions. So there's very little drainage area. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just for clarification's sake too, we're saying the wall prevents additional erosion on the back of the house by forcing the water to go to the side and it goes down through a swell into the proper drainage area it it does serve that purpose yes and if that wall were removed okay. it would continue to go down the slope behind the house it would depend on how they reestablish the slope from taking the wall out mm -hmm. the wall is about three feet tall so to take it out, you either cut back from the toe of the wall into the area that's already landscaped, mm -hmm. or you have to fill a little bit on the front side, or both. Uh, in doing that, you're going to create a, a swell of somewhere so that the drainage will go around the house. <clears throat> a follow-up question, Commissioner Richardson, or just again for helping to clarify this for uh, me. Does the wall help with drainage? Is there a practice? Is this is this as is this wall aesthetic, or does it have functional purpose? It helps some, but it's not like there's a lot of drainage coming down through there. Okay. But it does help some. Okay. But although it would help some, and I don't know how some is defined, there would still be a solution if, 
if the wall was removed with respect to the runoff? If, if the wall is removed, you, they, they will still need to create a drainage swell right. to go around right. uh, so that the back portion of that mm -hmm. drainage area in their backyard will drain around. Right now, the, the pipe behind the wall <coughs> discharges at the end of the wall and is closer to their side property line. Mm -hmm. So, you know, now they'll have to create the swell further into the middle of their backyard mm -hmm. to drain in each direction. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Thank you. I don't think anyone else has it. Oh, okay. Not a call. Okay, thank you. Okay. John, in your comments, when you said recommended approval and plant trees in front of the wall? Yes, uh, Commissioner Burrell. You know, staff your... the staff recommendation was to, to leave the wall where it is and to reestablish the 30 foot buffer with more plantings. Okay. So, you know, to, to me, that would define the green space that's supposed to be there, but you've got a wall in the middle. That's right. You know, but, <laughs> you know, as the board's kind of talked about with the wall, you know, taking the wall out causes oh. some more problems. You know, yeah. you gotta <laughs> fill it and add a swell to, to direct the drainage. You leave it where it is, it's already directing the drainage, and you don't have to disturb a whole whole bunch of earth to kind of get the same result. You know, the staff recommendation is really to replant a 30-foot buffer completely. Okay. And um, since the recording of the conservation easement was a step in the original zoning, um, that can be enforced? Yes, you know, it would... It'd also be my recommendation to to put some kind of time frame or trigger in here where they have to do that within a certain period of time. And that could be number of days or it could be you to direct staff not to issue any more building permits until it's done. Right. Okay. I agree. Not not to be labor, but sorry, <laughs> Richard saying. My issue with leaving the wall there is that, you know, we often talk about precedence and how this will set a precedence, et cetera. And I don't see where there will be a great benefit with respect to runoff and leaving it there. So when I weigh the runoff with it being there and not with it satisfying uh, the runoff or not, I just don't think that the benefit outweighs any future precedent that we may set. Because there still will be a solution for for the runoff. So it's not it, it's not a significant solution to to have it there versus, you know, any precedents that we may set moving forward. Okay. Was it staff's contention that this sets a precedent for other uh, it, it certainly could, um, but, you know, if you look at the circumstances of this spe specific case, you know, the wall does serve a small purpose in directing drainage. Uh, the neighbor behind them has not complained about it, who's the most impacted by this. And, you know, if they replant a full 30-foot buffer, you know, in my opinion, I think that would be more beneficial than what was there to begin with because it was kind of spindly and sparse. Okay. Um, and you can nod for, instead of having to walk up, but do we, do we have any way of quantifying some benefit? I'm sorry. So the, the phrase you used earlier was that there, the wall provides some benefit from stormwater runoff. Do we have any clarification on what some benefit means? Area of the tree. Okay, these come up, come up. If there's more than, if, if yeah, if there were a no, like a shake of no, I would have just said, don't worry about it. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> the area that drains behind the wall is draining out through the pipe. That that is a good benefit because taking the wall out is is eventually probably going to create more land disturbance than it would be leaving it in. Um, 
whether you leave the sod or not, if you plant it in front of the wall, then the area behind the wall would go around that planting and, and be less of the land disturbance. Um, taking the wall out, you're gonna have to do some grading. Planting, like John's recommendation, is not necessarily doing a lot of grading. Commissioner, thank you. I, I support ECCA's recommendation and perhaps where Commissioner Sheffield is leaning on removing that wall. I mean, if it wasn't put there, you wouldn't have the greater issue of land disturbance. Perhaps I have my legal hat on and I'm just thinking of, again, some little people that I know, but wearing my legal hat is a nuisance. It's a nuisance to keep a three foot wall that you, that you have in an open space area. It's, if a child climbs on that wall and that, can, well, I mean, you could say the HOA is gonna be responsible for it, but the, the HOA is gonna own that wall, a child can climb on it, and if that child is injured, it's a liability. And to me, you know in advance, you have noticed that you have something that can be attractive to a child. And if that child gets hurt, as an attorney, I'm arguing that this was a nuisance that that community should, will know, because I'm talking about it now, will know is going to potentially be their liability. Mm -hmm. Carl, just to follow up, and Kevin, maybe you need to um, supplement in with this. If I remember what was presented last month, essentially the whole reason why this homeowner constructed the wall with the drain was because they were having water run into their backyard, into the property, up to the house. Am I correct? Yeah, it was up to the house. So the wall was constructed to do that. So if we have them remove the wall, then they're going to have to go back in and construct the drainage swale or, or the swale that was supposed to be constructed prior to the house being turned over to the homeowner, which wasn't done. Um, again, the homeowner you can clearly see has built up to the property line. So now we're going to give an additional hardship to the property owner because now they're going to lose that whole back area of their property in addition to potentially their deck if we have to go in here and, and construct a drainage soil. I have never been a fan of the OSC code for these very reasons that we're discussing up here. Um, but I do support staff's recommendation of allowing this wall to remain just due to the fact that the additional work that's <laughs> gonna be need to be done to, to restore this is almost gonna be more dam damaging then um, allowing the wall to remain and then replanting. Question, who owns the open space area right now? Danny. I'm looking for the application, Madam Chair, because okay. uh, it has their signature on it. If sure. I could answer your yes, question, uh, the owner is 2671 Roswell Road, LLC, and that same sure. entity, that same uh, limited liability company is the one that owns the other okay. portions of the subdivision or uh, lots that haven't had, you know, haven't been sold or built. So, well, That's the developer for okay. our common term for we want to call I, it that. I think the onus is not on the property owners, on the developer. They, that's their property right. to fix and restore it to the condition that, you know, is suitable to the owner that lives there. They haven't turned it over to the yeah. HOA. Yeah. No, that's not, correct. They're not built It's been back. filed yet. Yeah, I think, um, hmm. The original intent for OSC was to create open spaces for people to gather and having open spaces behind homes was not something that was perceived to be of benefit to the entire community. Um, I will share that one of the things I was more interested in is 
having open space be truly open space for this plat. And if that is something that's on the table, certainly something I, I would like to pursue because, again, we, we already discussed the marker issues, the issue of land ownership, runoff, all of these different things. If the original intent of open space was actually met, we wouldn't have any of those questions. So that's where I have my deeper concern on this because we're, we're right now debating the, you know, should this homeowner be able, should there be a wall that prevents water from going into this home, into this home? And that's the wrong, I feel the wrong conversation. Um, that's just where we are in this case. So, I, I mean, my, my thing is that I was, I, I'm certainly, I was amenable to the wall staying, but I can also perceive an issue that if there's planting all around this wall, I just imagine kind of walking in a forest and there's a wall there. And I'm not sure if that's what's being recommended, but that, that's, what it, that's what it sounds like. And perhaps you can just make sure I'm tracking that that's what is being recommended. Correct. Yeah, I think that there are some concerns with that arrangement. Um, Maybe related, maybe not, and I hate to have this happen for the, is, is there, because you said the developer is responsive, is there any, and this, this site plan was approved, but because it hasn't been filed, is it, <coughs> is it permanent that that is where the open space needs to exist for this plat? That is where the, the board approved it. You know, it's possible that the developer could bring back another item to amend the open space and maybe lose a lot and, and get some open space back somewhere else. Because that's what I'm, I'm, I don't know what that means for this, for this hearing, but I would like to stick to the spirit of OSC in the goal that I think on the, on the developer side even, the lots are more valuable if those weren't considered open space as well. But then the runoff issue could be addressed and the goal of OSC could be accomplished. But I don't, I don't know what that means. I'm going to look for you for um, just guidance. If that is not something that can be incorporated as a part of holding this in that conversation, then I will take that recommendation and we'll just make a decision on this case as it sits in front of us. But I'm looking for, I, I don't know how I haven't seen, I haven't come across this exact opportunity. Okay, I, I think a good starting point for that is to to ask Mr. Moore. You know, if the developer and holder of the open space is open to doing some kind of swap, so there is no net loss of open space from the originally approved site plan. And, and I understand that he does not represent. Correct. He doesn't part, at all. That part. Thank you. With that qualification, we have had. Um, we've had a conversation that there needs to be a subdivision wide resolution reached and that they need to be a part of that. Um, but I don't represent them. I do know that standing here today, they don't have a code citation in their hands that you know, sometimes somebody needs to be made to come to the table, but they haven't been anything but cooperative. <laughs> They've been cooperative, but nobody is, I have not been able to get beyond simply the initial conversation. There's not been. Understood. They haven't engaged, is what I would call it. But I'm not. I don't want to throw somebody under the bus. They may be fully willing to, but correct. it's not. You don't uh, represent. We understand. You do correct. not represent. For the record, you do not. Represent correct. Them. But I do know that we don't own the property. Um. <laughs> Is, is, would the board be open to me holding this for 30 days to just see if there is an opportunity to reconcile these things? Yes, and get a conservation easement And get a con conservation easement file. <laughs> yes, that is on the list too. Okay. Yes. Well, um, okay. I would suggest, I mean, part of the recommendation that she said was potentially trading off. So if you get it off. If you had a conservation easement filed regarding the current plan, it would be different than what it would be. I mean, this is, 
like Mr. Moore pointed out, we have, you're talking about a party who's not here that you probably will not be able to get here in 30 days uh, through the legal process. So I would only have to be through cooperation. No, I appreciate that. <coughs> and this is why I'm asking the questions, because I'm trying to know what the options are. And, and adding on to what uh, the county attorney just said, you know, maybe it'd be better if you hold this for 60 days, since it is kind of a complicated issue involving different property owners and the zoning conditions and everything else. So maybe the board should look at continuing until, until the October 18th hearing to give some time to work things out. That's fine. Okay. Is the board agreeable to it? Thank you. Thank you all very much for your care and consideration on this OB. Then I motion to hold this case for 60 days till the October 18th Is it zoning hearing. October zoning hearing. Second. Second. Is there any discussion? Call the question. The motion passes 5 0. Thank you. Thank you. Chairman, we have a couple of extra items. Um, page four of your agenda. First part is an announcement, and with your permission, I'll, I'll read that announcement. Yes. Per the Planning Commission and the Board of Commissioners zoning hearing procedures, the July approval action of the PC and the BOC for rezoning case number Z43 shall be rescinded at the August 2nd PC hearing and the August 16th, 2022 BOC hearing. And the case will be put on hold to allow for proper notification mailings and proper signed posting. Uh, this case will be reheard at, uh, by the PC on September 6th, 2022, and by the BOC on their September uh, 20th, 2022 uh, zoning hearing date. The hearing will be held at 9 a.m. in the second floor meeting room located at 100 Cherokee Street, Marietta, Georgia. Thank you. Then the last piece of business is to amend something previously adopted. Uh, this is uh, regarding Section 25 of the Board of Commissioners Zoning and Land Use Hearing Procedures adopted January 11, 1994 and last revised October 19, 2004. Uh, which allows any commissioner to amend an action taken at a previous hearing. A second shall be required and full discussion shall be allowed. Uh, a majority vote will be or shall be required for adoption of the amendment and if passed, a second motion will be needed to revise its stipulations. Uh, this item would be to amend the motion by the Board of Commissioners re regarding rezoning case Z27 of 2022 as listed in the official minutes of the May 17th, 2022 meeting. Uh, the stipulation that needs to be added to the motion to perfect a record is to include the stipulation letter from Garvis L. Sams Jr. dated April 5th, 2022. Commissioner Sheffield? Yes. I make a motion to allow amending the previously adopted approval of Z27 from the May 17th, 2022 BOC zoning hearing minutes attached and made a part of these minutes. Okay. I'll second. Is there any discussion? Call the question. The motion passes 5-0. I believe that concludes uh, today. Uh, no. Uh, no? One more step. Oh, sure. Okay. I don't oh, sorry. That's okay. Uh, I make a motion to amend the list of stipulations for D Z27 from the May 17, 2022 BOC zoning hearing minutes to include the following stipulation. Number six, letter of agreeable conditions from Garvis L. Sams Jr. dated April 5th, 2022. All right, I'll second again. Is there any discussion? Call the question. The motion passes 5-0. Is there anything else to add? <laughs> All right. I believe our zoning hearing for this August 16th, 2022 is concluded. Thank you.